good evening everyone and welcome to our first perf web for 2019. i'm your host joe <laughs> the perf web 23 concepts in ecmo and this is going to be part one day one of what's going to be a several part series before i get started on anything that we're doing i have to go through these various things so social media you see the icons right over here over my left shoulder um, please 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 subscribe to our youtube channel if you have not already done so we are i think up to 641 subscribers we really need to get to a thousand it's very important so i'm asking you get a gmail account and subscribe i would like to see us blow over 700 at the end of the program today also on Facebook, please like us on Facebook and also share us. Okay, that's very important. And on Twitter, um, follow us on Twitter and share us there as well. So like us, sh uh, 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 follow us, share us on everything. YouTube, get a Gmail email account and do the uh, subscribe. That would help me very much. Our chat feature that you see right here if you're watching on YouTube, I'll be monitoring that right here on my computer from the desk. And on Facebook, if you have a question, one of the team will be monitoring Facebook in the back and they'll be uh, taking care of that. If there's any questions, we can do it. But we also have a call-in number. And the number you'll see us, it'll say phone lines are open. The phone is right here. I answer it here. You can be live on the air. We'll hear you over the speakers and you'll hear all of us over our microphone so you can be part of this discussion, which we would really like for you to do. Let me show you also our other resources, MediWeb, PerfWeb, and Perfusion Education. Please visit these places. Now, coming soon, we're also going to have NurseWeb and NurseCEU as well as ECMOWeb and ATS web, so we're gonna to continue to expand. But I do have to say before we get started and I introduce what is our incredible faculty and uh, also panelists for this evening, um, is that the team that has done this for 2019, you know, we really tried to step the game up. We had a great time in 2018. We did a great job uh, with developing the webinars, but we learned a lot as well. And we took January, February off this is our first webinar for 2019. We've done some retooling of everything, uh, added some additional features, and we're gonna continue to, to do these webinars. We want to be your single source resource for all of your CEUs. If you are one of the many perfusionists and uh, other medical professionals out there who cannot get to a meeting. So please, please, please <coughs> keep following us and look at what we can provide to you and get involved. Uh, in fact, our, one of our speakers today is coming all the way from Florida and is here. In fact, let me go ahead and introduce him right now. John Ingram, sitting right here to my right, is living in Florida on a boat. He is a Texas Heart graduate from 30 years ago, <coughs> uh, plus perhaps, what year did you graduate? 87. In 1980, sorry, you told me that, 1987. He is board certified. Uh, and uh, in adult perfusion as, and uh, well as pediatric and adult ECMO. He has several medical patents and he has served as a consultant for multiple manufacturers. He's published a lot of uh, 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 evidence-based medicine and original research in the literature and he's uh, presented at multiple meetings as well. He's currently, uh, he was 15 years as a chief perfusionist. Where were you the chief at? In Miami. In Miami, you know, at, with who's Shang Baluki? No, nope, down with uh, Dr. Pastel back in the Dr. Days. Pastel. Did you know uh, Lamellis? Yes, Dr. I did. Lamellis. I worked with Dr. Because he came here, he went back. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, he went back. He went back. Did he? He's back in Miami, as yep, a matter of fact. I worked with him. And uh, but perfusionist for 30 years, and currently he's doing per diem work, providing coverage, locum coverage around the country, and apparently having a blast and making a whole bunch of money. So we're very happy with that. Um, also coming to us from Nashville is Matt Warhoover. I think we have a picture of Matt. He may not be up quite yet. He's going to be coming in Skype. Do we have a picture of Matt? Yeah, there he is. And uh, Matt is the Associate Chief Perfusionist at uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. 
and he is he has a master of science in perfusion as well as a master of management in healthcare. So he really has a very broad and a bachelor in, in biology and a major in civil engineering. He's a really bright guy and he's going to be talking to us about ECMO economics as well. Um, now in our, on our panel is Brianna Thomas. She's sitting immediately to John's right and Brianna graduated from uh, Rush Perfusion Training Program in Chicago, right? Yeah, yes, Chicago, Chicago. In 2016, mm -hmm. and she's been with us down here in Houston now. She was working in Detroit for some time, yes. and now you're down here in Houston for about the past five six months, months yeah, five, five months, six months, working down at Memorial TMC in the Medical Center and also down at Memorial Southeast for our group, and we're happy to have her, lucky to have her, and I think that the newer graduates today, they, their training was different, and I think that she's going to have some interesting perspectives. Now, eventually, and immediately to her right, he'll probably be here after the break, is Min Tran. Min Tran is a graduate of Texas Heart Institute, and Min has been a, a perfusion. He graduated in 20, 2008 from Texas Heart. John also came from Texas Heart. So we have me from Tucson, Texas Heart, Rush and then Texas Heart down on the end. So we'll get to uh, Min. We'll introduce him more formally when he gets here. Uh, I have some questions before we start the actual presentation. And again, welcome everybody. I'm so glad everybody is here. John, this is a really interesting subject, acute kidney injury. And I believe, frankly, that most clinicians not just perfusionists, but most clinicians grossly underestimate or undervalue the kidney. We just don't think about it. We worry about stroke. We worry about whether the heart was protected, getting patients off bypass. And I think a lot of that has to do with we don't necessarily see the patients post-operative unless they're on ECMO. So tell us, if you will, what got you interested in this and involved in this and some of the background to what you have done in research to get to the point of you're going to give us these presentations tonight? Well, Joe, you asked some excellent questions because those exact questions are questions that I'm going to be addressing in the talk. But I can tell you that um, you're absolutely correct. We've begun to accept acute kidney injury as just a part of what's going to happen. And I'm going to touch on why that is. Uh, it's a vast and complex subject um, with multi, multi factorials that go involved. But me, myself, uh, being a traveler for the last four or five years, um, you see a lot of good things out there, but you also see some things that are a little eye opening. I don't necessarily mean in a negative way. I mean, sometimes just think to yourself, wow, I wonder if that is really a good way or if that's really something we should look into. And over the years that I've been doing this, I've noticed that there's been some changes. You've been mm -hmm. doing this about as long as I have, maybe longer. And I remember back in the 80s and 90s, uh, there were some things that are significantly different now mm -hmm. that, we, that we didn't do. And um, that, in addition to the fact that I read some reports about how acute kidney injury is really on the rise. And amazingly enough, in the last 20 years, we've actually spent a lot of time trying to decrease acute kidney injury, but yet it's actually much on the rise. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to talk about that. So be based on that, I began to really think in the last year or so, what is really going on here? And that's what really got me started on, uh, on this topic. And then when I contacted you to see if you'd have any interest, it's a topic that I think you've, you've had dear to your heart for quite some time. It, it really is. And I think, again, I, I wish more people would be more involved with understanding this. You know, we have, of course, I was going to, I'm somewhat curious, we could save it for perhaps the discussion period, but uh, talking about CRRT and CDVH and ultrafiltration, and I'll tell you this, there's a real interesting uh, thing that just happened. They, they just had an AMSEC meeting in, I believe it was in Nashville. And uh, they, um, the, uh, uh, in fact, you just, you just mentioned his name, Al Stammers. Al Stammers and several other people um, there, and they had a, a physician there as well, some anesthesiologist, I believe, that absolutely refuses to permit ultrafiltration on pump. Now. I wasn't there, so I'm getting this information relayed to me. So if I do get anything wrong, full disclosure, I was physically not there. But nevertheless, yes. Hello? Oh. Um, I, I'm sorry. I thought somebody was calling. Um, I wasn't physically there. We get, I'm sorry. We get, we get you some 
Huh? Phone. Oh, Min, your phone? You give me back. Huh? Yours. No, it's not my phone. Okay. I gave it to... Uh, I get my phone up there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you, you have a phone? Yes, yeah, sure. I don't have a phone. No. Sure. Okay. Are we good now? I think we're having a sound problem, so just hold on a second. We'll figure it out. Ah, it was Min Q, Tr Min Tran. Put the camera on Min. Min's here finally. <laughs> Showed up late and disrupting the show already. There he is. I mean, he's my favorite, so it's okay. I, I forgive him. It doesn't matter. He can do whatever he wants. Um, but uh, during the meeting, they were uh, uh, really trying to drive home an agenda and a point. From what I understand, that ultrafiltration is bad and we should not be doing it on pump. That that is what is causing AKI or acute kidney injury and acute renal failure. So with that said, would you like to give your talk first or do you want to talk about that? Maybe add, save that for the discussion. What do you want to do? Uh, I think I'll address that now because I don't address that exactly in the talk because this is, like I said, such a vast uh, talk on that subject. But in my travels, as I was mentioning to you, I have come across places and surgeons that will actually kick you out of the room if they caught you with a hemoconcentrator in your circuit. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that there's so many conflicting papers that have come out on all of this to do with acute kidney injury. And as I said before, there's been a tremendous effort to try to reduce acute kidney injury, and it's been nothing but grown. And as far as hemoconcentration is concerned, what I always tell people when they ask me this is if you go on bypass, if your pre-pump uh, pre hematocrit is, let's just say, 35, whatever number you want to use, and you go on pump and your hematocrit is 25, and you use a hemoconcentrator and you bring your hematocrit back up to 30, how are you dehydrating the patient when by definition you're still hemodiluted? So the well, argument, unless you... <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, that's common sense. And, and Seems to be suspended a lot of times. Right, the common, the common sense with hemoconcentrator I think has been thrown out the window. Well, maybe somebody can argue against that, but when, when the surgeon or, or a CCM doctor or the nephrologist says, you've dehydrated my patient, he's come back, you've taken all his fluid off during the pump run, well, we, we're not even as concentrated as he, were, as he was when, when he came in. How did we dehydrate him? So I'm not really following how we are dehydrating patients with a hemoconcentrator. Now, if you chemoconcentrate, and I'm not sure how you would accomplish this, above the baseline hematocrit, which I don't know how you have the volume to do that, then I guess you'd have an argument. I don't think I've ever seen that in my career. You'd have to Only compromise with a very flow. You could do it. You could compromise or, flow. Or if you had a very severely polycythemic patient, you might be able to do it. Yeah. I don't know. But I have almost never seen that. And I use the hemoconcentrator so almost 100% of the time. So if it was you yeah. having surgery, do you want a unit of pack cells or do you want me to ultrafiltrate off a thousand cc's, my prime. You can ultra filter it off 2,000 if you want. <laughs> okay, fine, that'll be great. Okay, so I think we're gonna have some real lively discussion with this because this is great. And you guys need pad and paper to write any notes down or anything like that? Maybe we'll go, okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started on your presentation and um, and then we can attack on that later. And also, sure. real quickly, you did, how many, how many papers did you read to put this talk together? Well, this is a literature review, as I mentioned to you, and as it easily could have read upwards of 1,000, but I did a close to 300 papers that I've read on this and tried to compile and bring all of this together so that it could be meaningful tonight when we talk about it. Sounds good. So that, okay. was, that was my, my, my effort anyway. Okay, I think we're ready to get your presentation started. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you so much for that introduction, Joe. And um, like Joe mentioned, I want to talk tonight about acute kidney injury and in regards to, uh, in particular in regards to how it affects us as perfusionists, but it's such a vast complex topic that uh, um, especially as it relates to cardiac surgery and I really want to shed some light on this topic in general and then by the time we conclude with the second session I hope to examine the role that we as perfusionists play in, uh, in post-operative AKI so let's see if I can manage the slides so being such that it's a vast such a vast topic I thought I would break up tonight's discussion in two uh, 30 minute sessions as you invited me to do Joe and in this first segment I'm going to cover these top four that are highlighted, and in the second segment, we're going to cover the bottom two uh, topics that are shown here. So let's start out by looking at the thing that got me most interested in this topic, and that is the actual incidence of AKI post-bypass. So we can dispense with this now. So in addition to all the things that I was seeing as a traveler, when I came across this presentation in 2017 by the American Society of Nephrology in their annual kidney week, um, 
they reported that they had looked at cabbage-only patients. Now, you're not talking about complex procedures, double valve, circuitry arrest, or cabbage valve, just straight cabbage patients. And they looked from 2004 to 2012, and they discovered that the incidence of post-cabbage AKI had increased 290%. And that really was what pushed me over the edge to go into researching this. And everything I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm going to reinforce with multiple large center studies. And um, hopefully you can take uh, some of these studies and read them for yourself. But looking at um, the incidence of AKI post-op, post here's two examples of some studies, and there's very many you could look at. But in 2015, BMC Nephrology uh, Journal uh, looked at 443 patients, Dr. Lagney, uh, and they, their, their patient load, they had an incidence of 49.9%. And then in Annals of Thoracic Surgery 2009, Dr. Benedetto looked at 705 of their patients, and they discovered that 274, which is almost 39 percent, of their under, uh, uh, developed in a conventional cardiopulmonary bypass, de developed AKI. So I'm not going to focus so much on renal failure, but you don't get renal failure without first having acute kidney injury, and if it's severe enough, that's how patients end up in renal failure. And when you do finally get to the worst endpoint, which is renal failure, the mortality rate just skyrockets. So right from the beginning, we need to be very conscious of not creating AKI in the first place, right? Well, in the Annals of Cardiac Anesthesia 2016, here's an excerpt from this paper. It said in uh, acute kidney injury when it's in its most severe form, meaning renal failure, the increases the odds of operative mortality three to eight times. In the Euro, uh, European Journal of Cardiac Surgery in 2011, Dr. Romanin uh, and his group looked at 2,500 consecutive patients that underwent cardiac surgery at their institution. And when they took the ones that had developed renal failure, the mortality rate was 37.8 percent. So what is acute kidney injury? Well, in 2007, there emerged a classification because a lot of people were writing papers and making claims and defining what acute kidney injury was differently. So it wasn't an apples and apples comparison. That's part of the confusion with how many papers have been written claiming one thing over the other. So they, they tried to define it, and a, a, the Aiken classification came out, which stands for Acute Kidney Injury Network. And the purpose was to define and quantify the severity of AKI. It also enabled us to monitor the progression of the patient, either getting better or worse. And this classification focuses mainly on serum creatinine. And then it really looks at uh, what's defined as renal, uh, a decrease in renal function over the first 48 hours of the injury. So I don't want to dwell too long on this, but just to show you, the Aiken criteria has three stages. One risk, two injury, and three failure, and it basically looks at serum creatinine. Um, and if you have a serum creatinine increase from your baseline of one and a half to twofold, you're considered in the risk category. If you have two to three time increase, it's injury, and over three time in increase in serum creatinine, uh, you're in renal failure. You could also look at urine output uh, over a six, 12, or 24 hour period, but we're going to focus on serum creatinine mostly for this talk. The problem with this classification is it has severe limitations in and of itself. Now, it is the industry standard for classifying AKI, so at least when people write papers and make mention of it, we're all looking at the same yardstick. But the problem is it uses traditional measures of renal function, that is creatinine and urine output, and they're very delayed responses, and we're going to talk about each one of these, what's wrong with this in the next slides. But not only does it uh, take a while for them to show up, it provides no information as to what the nature of the injury was. Was it an ischemic injury? Was it a nephrotoxic drug? Was it inflammatory? Or was it oxidative? Um, it's not useful in the early detection of AKI because it takes 24 to 72 hours before, for example, creatinine levels even show up in the blood to be detected by the lab. So what we need to be able to do is immediately detect the injury, stop the injury, or stop doing whatever it is we're doing that's causing it and quickly treat the injury, and we remain very far from that capability. So all of you are familiar with what you do every morning before the case, you look at the patient's BUN and creatinine. So let's look at what, what's wrong with that. Well, creatinine is, as I said before, it's unsuitable for detecting acute injury, and this is something I really want you to take home in the very first part of this lecture. Serum creatinine only increases at all after 50% of your nephrons have been injured. 
If you don't have a 50% injury of your nephrons, you won't even see an increase in serum creatinine. This is why we can donate an entire kidney and our serum creatinine levels won't go up. So if you looking in the morning of your patient and you see a slight increase in serum creatinine and say, oh, well, that's no big deal, it'll go back down a day or two, that patient had to have suffered a 50% insult to his nephrons. What's wrong with the BUN? Well, BUN rises if the kidneys are unable to remove adequate urea from the blood at that particular point in time that you took the test. That's all it's telling you. Um, but unfortunately, there are many causes of an increased BUN. So let's look at that for a minute. BUN and creatinine have limitations. BUN is not specific to AKI. Why is that? Because it's affected by many non-renal factors not related to kidney injury. For example, if you're a person that likes to work out and eat a high-protein diet, or you have a high muscle mass, your, your BUN is naturally going to be higher. If you have a fever, your, your BUN is going to be higher. If you're hypovolemic or dehydrated, it's going to be higher. If you're in congestive heart failure. And over there on the, on the right, you see race, sex, and age. Different races, your sex and your age, all affect your normal level of BUN. Well, creatinine is not sensitive enough, and I said already, it takes one to three days for it to, to, to show up in, in your blood, in your blood, blood tests. So probably at least 20 years ago, there started to be a search for better biomarkers of AKI. Um, and what these biomarkers are, they're proteins that are released from the kidney during injury or during a stress that the, that the kidney has suffered. These markers are, have advantages over creatinine and BUN because they're more sensitive. They're, they, they're evident in the plasma and the urine within hours, not days. And they're more specific. They actually can indicate what segment of the nephron has been injured. We're going to look at that in a second. So there's probably 300 of these biomarkers that have been discovered, and I've listed about 20 of them here. I highlighted the most common ones there on the top, but most of you have probably never heard of any of these. Uh, top one saying NGAL, C-statin uh, C, interleukin. I doubt any of you have probably ever looked at a chart and ever seen what the patient's NGAL level is, and, uh, or C-statin, or KIM-1, and the reason is that 95 plus percent of hospitals are not even doing this test. Number one, because it still takes hours after the injury for it to show up and the damage is already done. And number two, most physicians are not even ordering it and a lot of labs don't even have the ability to, 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 to do the uh, test anyway. So, but one good thing has emerged and that is that at least it's nephron segment specific. And I've shown here, listed various ones of what segment of the nephron would have been injured if a certain biomarker does uh, peak. So let me just talk about acute kidney injury, the types and categories. The best way to categorize it, there are several ways, but most commonly people like to look at a hemodynamic type of insult, which would be an ischemic insult followed by reperfusion, or an inflammatory uh, type of injury, which would be something nor hormonal, an inflammatory mediators or oxidative stress, and then there's nephrotoxic, which falls with nephrotoxic agents, which many pharmaceutical agents are nephrotoxic. Most people don't know that. Um, so what I wanted to do in getting more involved with, with where it pertains to perfusion is look at the risk factors <clears throat> that patients have. And all of these risk factors are increase your opportunity or your likelihood that you're going to uh, have acute kidney injury. And I think you're going to be a little amazed because almost everything conceivable has been linked to being a risk factor for AKI, and these are just the preoperative ones. These are the ones that patients would present to us with already, sort of a little bit out of our control, but just run down a few of them. If the patients are anemic, looking on the left side, anemia, NPO status, well, all of our patients are NPO, actually increases your likelihood. Advanced age, left main disease, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, COPD, peripheral vascular disease, if you have a balloon pump, history of stroke, history of smoking, LV dysfunction. I mean, we're, common, we're familiar with all of these. And just like with coronary artery disease, if you have multiple risk factors, the likelihood that you're going to have CAD goes up. Well, this is the same thing that's true with AKI. And I think this is part of the reason, Joe, you were asking why we've come to just accept it. Because if you have a patient that comes up with post-op AKI, you say, well, look at all the risk factors they came in with. Of course they're going to have AKI. Well, let's look at the perioperative risk factors, and this affects us more direct as perfusionists, well, 
valvular, any complicated uh, uh, multiple procedure uh, surgeries, emergencies, reoperations. Of course, we've always talked about non-pulsatility affecting the kidneys a little bit negatively, but anytime you have low flow perfusion, hypothermia, by the way, causes vasoconstriction of the renal arteries, long bypass runs, anemic states, hemodilution, hemolysis, red blood cell transfusions, uh, venous congestion, reinstitution of bypass. So all of these things now are additional factors that we've added in the, in the operation stage. What about once the patient gets to the ICU and in the days and the weeks to follow? Well, if they become unstable in the ICU and have any episode of low cardiac output, or if they become hypovolemia, of hypovolemic, or if they become hypotensive, if they have to be given vasopressors. Um, there's medicines, quite a few meds that alter the renal uh, blood flow regulation, and um, ACE inhibitors are one. If the patient becomes uh, instable, uh, if the patient becomes sep septic. So by the end of the day, if you say the patient has acute kidney injury, where do you begin to say which one or many of these was the real cause? I hope to narrow that down for you. A little bit. So why are there so many risk factors and causes of, a of AKI? In order to understand that, we have to go through and fully understand renal anatomy and physiology. So we're going to take a good look at, so just starting from the very beginning, you guys know that you have two kidneys. The one on the left is mounted slightly higher than the one on the right. The kidneys are, uh, come right off the abdominal aorta, and they're fed by a very uh, large renal artery. And the, um, looking at it a little bit closer, I want to point out just a few things on this cutaway slide. If you look uh, sort of in the center where it says renal pelvis, this is the support structure that gives the kidney its support. And this is where the renal artery would enter, the renal vein would depart, you have the ureter that comes out. The next thing I want to point out is the cortex and the medulla. This is really uh, two of the most important sections of the kidney. The cortex mostly carries a vast majority of the, of the blood vessels. And in the medulla is mostly where your uh, nephrons are located. The nephron does overlap partially the cortex and the medulla, and we're going to look into that a little closer now. So the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Just like the alveoli, alveolus is for the, uh, for the lung, the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. And if you see there where I've shown, uh, it says arterial blood enters enters the uh, lobular artery and it's carrying excess waste on its way into the kidney. And as it gets up, it branches off into the afferent, afferent arterial. And I want you to remember afferent arterial, and I want you to remember right above it, efferent arterial. The afferent arterial is what feeds blood directly into the glomerulus, which starts the urine uh, manufacturing process, okay? So the afferent arterial comes into the glomerulus and it's a vast bundle network of capillaries that's wound inside there. And then as it comes out, it exits as an efferent arterial. And then as the efferent arterial then traces down as a vast network of capillaries that intertwines with the, all the distal tubule, the proximal tubule, tubule, and the loop of Henle. And in between the tubules and this vast network of, of uh, capillaries is where the urine exchange process occurs, eventually ending up in urine being produced and taken out the, um, to the uh, ureter. So there's 1 to 1.5 million nephrons per kidney, and I've kind of shown there where it, about a third of it is in the cortex, but the, the heavy work and the heavy lifting, two-thirds of the nephron actually resides down into the medulla, and that's going to become more important. If you look at an anatomical view, here, you see that there's actually two different uh, nephrons. They do the same thing. One is a little bit shorter than the other one. That one's the cortical nephron. The one that's longer dives much deeper into the medulla is the juxtamedullary nephron. But for, for all practical purposes, they do the same thing. And if you look at the top uh, part of the slide where you see the cortex, this is where the process starts, where the, where the blood supply comes into the glomerulus. And then the uh, nephron quickly dips down into the medulla and ends up back up, up into the cortex. So the nephron makes urine in three major steps. We're going to talk about this. This is important to understand. First step is filtration. That occurs in the glomerulus. And as I said before, you have the afferent artery coming in to the glomerulus and then exiting as an efferent artery. And this is the filtration process occurs there. 
Then in the rest of the nephron, both reabsorption and secretion occur. And it's, as I said before, an interplay between a vast network of capillaries that intertwine and mix with the, uh, the, the tubules. So let's look at this a little closer. The three steps to urine formation, as I said, are filtration. So if you look there on the left, a vast, uh, a net, vast network of capillaries is bundled up inside the glomerulus. And what occurs here is that the blood deposits an enormous amount of its plasma into this tubule. It's actually referred to as plasma filtrate. It's so similar to plasma. So it, the, the textbooks on nephrology actually use the word dumped. They actually use that word because it's such an enormous amount of plasma that's discharged into the tubules at this point. Uh, and it's referred to as plasma filtrate. Once it enters the tubules, it then traverses down and goes through the tubules. And then the second step begins to occur, which is reabsorption. And this is a vast process where much of what was dumped into the, the tubules gets reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. We're going to talk about why that is in a minute. But that's a very rigorous process. Even though the blood in the filtration process dumped this vast amount of plasma into the tubules, it didn't actually dump everything. It didn't dump all of the waste. So there still has to be additional waste that has to sift over from the capillaries to the tubules. And that's, that aspect of the uh, steps are called secretion, where additional waste is removed from the blood. Okay, so. Looking at this a little bit closer, filtration is driven by starling forces. How does it happen that these capillaries are able to dump so much plasma into the glomerulus? Well, starling forces, as you know, is a combination of os os osmotic, forces, osmotic forces and hemodynamic forces. And 180 liters a day of filtrate enters our tubules every day. And as I said, it's essentially, it's essentially like plasma, but it has no cellular components or large proteins. Now, what's interesting is that 98% of this plasma filtrate that was sent through in filtration, 98% of it will, will end up being reabsorbed back into the blood, and the remaining will be excreted as waste. So the reabsorption process is the process by, why, by which all these useful solutes, the glu glucose, amino acids, ions, and water are, are removed from the filtrate and returned back into the blood. Now, 99% of the water and 99% of the sodium will actually be reabsorbed during, during reabsorption. This is kind of like if you had a, something rotten in your refrigerator full of food, and instead of going in there and finding the one rotten thing, you take every single thing out and re-put it all back in, less the one rotten item. That's sort of how the kidney works. The secretion phase is one final step where additional waste that didn't quite make it in so far is uh, secreted back over to the tubules. And these items include potassium, hydrogen, ammonium items, creatinine, urine, urea, and some hormones and drugs. This is how they are excreted through the urine. So looking at this in its snapshot, the afferent arterial comes in. It's a wide coil bundle of capillaries deposits an enormous amount of its plasma into the tubules. And then after that, there's this interplay between the capillary network and the tubules where fluid that did not need to be excreted gets reabsorbed back into the blood, and some waste that still haven't made it over gets secreted back into the tubules. So your final product is excreted as, as urine. So what I have on the left is, and this is important to us as perfusionists, is that the quantity of urine that's produced does largely depend upon blood flow, but it's far from the only factor. What do I mean by that? If you're on bypass, and I see this all the time as a traveler, surgeons say, what is the urine output? Well, it's such and such. Well, that's not good enough. Give 20 of Lasix. Well, if you give any diuretic, what you're doing is you're, you're affecting the reabsorption phase or the secretion phase. So if you can decrease reabsorption, sure, you're going to have a lot more urine coming out. But you haven't changed your blood flow to the, to the, to the nephron. If, you have, if your problem was inadequate blood flow, you haven't affected that at all. In fact, you may have made things worse because now you're stressing the kidney to work harder with less blood flow. So that's something to think about. So let's talk about renal blood flow. Well, as I said, you have the abdominal aorta. The renal artery is a very large artery, comes in. As the main artery, it quickly branches off into the segmental arteries. 
then the segmental arteries branch off into what's called lobular arteries. And if you look on the right, the lobular artery then feeds all these afferent arterioles which go into the glomerulus. Okay, so the glomerulus is where the process starts, and as you can see there, the efferent artery exits the glomerulus and forms this vast network around the tubules in which, uh, in which uh, happens all the uh, interplay between reabsorption and secretion. So the kidneys require 20% of the cardiac output at rest. Some textbooks even say 25%, but most seem to say it's 20%, being the second largest organ demanding of cardiac output only next to the liver. But why do the kidneys require so much blood supply? And the answer is because they are in a constant state of production of enormous amount of ATP. This ATP is necessary for all that reabsorption I was telling you about. But consider this, and this is a take-home slide if you want to snapshot something. The kidneys filter 100 liters of fluid a day. 179 liters is reabsorbed. 99% of the sodium is reabsorbed, but that has to be powered by the sodium potassium ATPase pump. This requires one ATP to pump three sodium ions out and two potassium ions back into the cell. That's very expensive. It talks a lot of ATP just to move three ions and two back into the cell. Well, anaerobic metabolism, glycolysis, only produces two molecules of ATP. Well, oxidative phosphorylation, aerobic metabolism, generates 34 molecules of ATP. So this is why we have to have so much oxygen. But in order to retrieve 99% of the sodium, you need to create and manufacture 1.7 times 10 to the 24th power molecules of ATP per day. In other words, 1.7 with 24 zeros behind it of ATP a day must be manufactured by your kidneys in order to continue this reabsorption process going properly. This is why you need so much oxygen delivered to the kidneys to manufacture this ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. But that's not all. Besides sodium, there's an additional 20% more than that of ATP that must be produced for the reabsorption of other things. That was just for sodium. You need to reabsorb glucose, amino acids, and other ions. Now, the kidney is a unique organ for three reasons. This is another take-home slide. We're going to expand and talk about each one of these in detail. But the kidney is unique from every other organ for these three reasons. Due to the way the kidney functions, it's the only organ to which we cannot provide a luxurious oxygen, su oxygen supply. In other words, we cannot overperfuse the kidney. The blood flow to the renal parenchyma, that's the cortex and the medulla and the tissues of the kidney is inhomogeneous. In other words, there's a regional variation in the tissue oxygenation. And thirdly, the renal oxygen demand remains nearly the same regardless of temperature. We're going to talk about this, but the, the oxygen consumption of the kidney, 80% of it is to manufacture the ATP I was talking about. Only 20% of that oxygen demand is for basal metabolism. So let's explore each one of these real quickly. The kidney is unique for item number one. Due to the way the kidney functions, the only organ we cannot provide a luxurious oxygen supply. What do we mean by that? Well, as you increase your, your supply of oxygen, i.e. your blood supply, you also increase the filtration, reabsorption, and secretion, which means you're consuming ATP, which means you have to replace that ATP, and therefore your oxygen demand correlates right up with your increase in supply. In other words, the kidneys work like a, like a package sorting plant. Like if you've ever been to UPS or FedEx, the more packages you send down the main line, the more packages have to be sorted. So the sorters have to work that much harder. So next time you go to FedEx, they can send all the packages down the line they want. You can send all the oxygen to the kidney you want. But these poor sorters over here on the left are going to have to work that much harder. And that's exactly what happens with the nephrons in the kidneys as you begin to perfuse it more and more. So these poor guys over here are demanding more oxygen, right? So don't take my word for it. I'm going to, like I said before, I support everything with, uh, with papers and uh, multiple papers if possible. So number one, we cannot overperfuse the kidney. Here is uh, two research papers that I've listed there, but there are many more. And I've just taken excerpts from each one of these, and most of them uh, have the same uh, words stated inside them. But the first one, 
Increased renal blood flow does increase oxygen supply, but it also increases oxygen to demand due to the reabsorption of sodium, which is a major determinant of renal oxygen consumption. The second thing, increased oxygen delivery by renal blood flow is directly counteracted by an increased oxygen consumption. Any maneuvers that you make to increase glomerular filtration rate and thus sodium reabsorption also increase oxygen consumption. So let's look at number two, why the, why the kidney is a unique organ. Blood flow to the renal parenchyma is inhomogeneous. There is a regional variation in tissue oxygenation. So the high renal blood flow, that 20% of cardiac output, is first directed to the cortex to optimize the filtration reabsorption, or reabsorption process, right? The PO2 coming in is 50. When it comes into the afferent artery, it's a PO2 of 50. Next, the renal tissues are perfused by that efferent arteries, which carry poorly oxygenated blood, leading to borderline renal tissue hypoxia. And this effect is most pronounced in the medulla, where the PO2 is at all times between 10 and 25. So as you see on the slide there, uh, the photo slide at the top of the left, PO2 comes in at a PO2 of 50, begins the process. And as this vast network of capillaries dives down into the medulla and interchanges with the nephron, the PO2 goes down between 10 and 25, usually about 20. And you can see there on the right, what's happening here on the right, as you see as the vast network of uh, capillaries interplays with the tubules, look how the blood changes from red to purple to blue. Well, if all it's doing is exchanging solutes with the nephron, why is it losing oxygen? And that's because it's not only doing that, it's also perfusing and oxygenating the tissues of the nephron, but also the tissues of the stroma, the surrounding tissues, the nerves, the connective tissue, and the blood vessels that are supporting all of these nephrons in place. Okay, so if you consider the way that the lung is perfused, we have two separate uh, blood supplies to the lung. One is for the functional unit of the lung, the pulmonary circulation, but then we have a whole other entirely separate uh, uh, blood supply called the bronchial circulation, which perfuses the tissues of the lung. Well, the kidneys do that same thing, but instead of having two separate supplies, it does it in series, meaning it has to do the, the job of both. So you end up with a very low PO2 in the medulla. Well, supported by research, item number two, here is four research papers at the bottom, and these are the quotes from a number of those. Kidney physiology and function are particularly dependent on oxygen supply. This, this effect is particularly pronounced in the renal medulla where PO2 levels are as low as 10 to 25. It's not surprising that the kidney might be the first organ to be uh, affected by a global reduction in delivery of oxygen. And in vitro studies have demonstrated that the area of the kidneys are prone to ischemic injury in cases of even slight reductions in renal delivery of oxygen. Number three, third reason why the kidneys are unique. The renal consumption of oxygen remains the same regardless of temperature. Now, I don't think this is something too many people have ever thought of. We've been told that as you cool temperature, metabolism decreases. If you have a, a high temperature, metabolism increases. Well, this slide, if you look at the bottom half there, where it says, shows the heart and it says at rest, that's the renal, uh, that is the body's blood distribution per, by percentage of the cardiac output. So let's just say at rest, cardiac output is five liters a minute. And you see I've uh, had a box in the pink box there, it says 20%. That's the 20% of cardiac output going to the, to the kidneys. What, let's say you're in heavy exercise, so the top half of that, that diagram. Heavy exercise, and you're, heavy, and you're doing a lot of exercise, and your cardiac output increases to, let's say, 25 liters a minute. So now look at the pink box. It says 2 to 4 percent. So there's a distribution of blood supply. Obviously, you need a lot more blood supply to your muscles and less blood supply to your, to your internal organs. So the, internal, so the kidneys now only accept 2 to 4 percent at a 25 uh, liter per minute output. So look at the right side of the slide where it says, at rest, if we have a five liter minute cardiac output and the kidneys require 20%, that equals one liter per minute of blood flow to the kidneys. At heavy exercise, at 25 liters a minute, they only require 4%. 4% of 25 is also one liter a minute. So here's a fun fact. 80% of the oxygen consumed by the renal, by the kidneys, is used for the production of ATP. The basal metabolic rate only accounts for 20% of the consumption of oxygen. 
Here's the verification through studies of, of uh, point number three that the uh, temperature that temperature does not affect consumption of, of uh, the kidneys. Uh, Dr. Bridwani looked at 450 low risk cabbage patients. This was in annuals of thoracic surgery, 2009. They did mild CPB hypothermia and they found there was no protective ne nephroprotective effect. Their quote is one would expect hypothermia to be nephroprotective, which was not observed in our study. Now, Dr. Swamanathan <laughs> in annuals of thoracic surgery, 2001, they specifically set out. To, di to discover whether this was true or not, and they purposely perfused patients at normothermic, 37, and they, same set of patients, they did at 28 degrees. They found no difference in renal outcome, and their conclusion was, we did not confirm a renal protective effect of cold cardiovascular bypass compared with warm. Because of what I just said, the renal delivery of oxygen, demand of oxygen, is mainly due to the production of ATP, and that's not temperature dependent. So here are three take-home messages that I want you to remember if you can. We cannot provide a luxurious oxygen supply because increased oxygen delivery by renal blood flow is directly counteracted by an increase in oxygen consumption. Number two, the medulla exists on the border of hypoxia. It lives in a hypoxic state with a PO2 of only 10 to 25. There is no margin of error for us to decrease delivery of oxygen to the medulla. It's already between 10 and 25. Thirdly, renal consumption of oxygen is the same regardless of temperature. Hyperthermia or hypothermia does not seem to alter renal demand for oxygen. So low oxygen availability occurs during cardiac surgery, which I believe and the data suggests is a common cause of ischemic acute kidney injury. Thank you guys for listening. Wow. That, I'm going to applaud that. Was that. that was a great presentation, yeah. That was a, a heck of a presentation. Okay, so, you know, just uh, uh, I think what we're going to do, because we have a big discussion period, and I've, all, I've got a lot of questions, okay? These are for, the, uh, for when we turn this presentation into an SDCE. You have to submit eight questions per presentation, so I was doing that. These are the questions that I want to ask. I don't want you to think that I have two pages of questions. <laughs> um, but regardless, um, you know, this, is, this also affects us, because this is an ECMO, actual, an ECMO mm -hmm. sort of mini course, if mm -hmm. you will. And this is a big problem in ECMO. Mm -hmm. Everything that you showed there, you know, cardiac output issues, oxygenation issues, um, uh, uh, sepsis issues, multiple presser issues. Mm -hmm. And I know you'll be talking about phenylephrine in your next talk. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this ties into the ECMO very, mm -hmm. I think, well, but also mm -hmm. for the standard cardiopulmonary bypass. But why don't we do this? How about if we take a short break get you some more liquid refreshment, um, and I can <clears throat> maybe reintroduce Min, and then we'll get your next talk. We'll go to that, and then we'll go to, um, to uh, uh, Matt and do his, uh, his Skype in for economics, ECMO economics, and then we'll open the phones up and do all of that kind of stuff. Before we go on break, did you guys have any questions, any, anything you wanted to say? I'll save it for discussion. Save it for discussion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. Mm -hmm. um, Silent Scope 1032, I don't know who they are, they don't, they don't say who they are, said that Min was late, was probably handing out M&Ms, and that's why he's late. So apparently you know who Silent Scope is. I don't. Hmm. I, can, so, I can take a guess who it is. You can take a guess who it is. Okay, so we'll take a, a short five-minute break, and then we'll come back, and we'll get to neosinephrine as a potential cause of AKI. And focus on delivery of oxygen. And focus on O2 delivery, right. exactly. Okay, good, five minute break.
Oh, we see. Oh, okay, and welcome back to the program. So, look, I got to tell you, I've been. We did this all last year, and uh, you know, we did some really good talks out of this. Okay, mm -hmm. we've had some great people that have sat here and given some incredibly incredible lectures. Yours is way up at the top, and possibly even the best, as far as I'm concerned. That was a heck of a lot of information mm -hmm. that you uh, uh, gave us. And I, I wrote as fast as I could. You speak fast, OK? Yeah, I, I thought I did, but you speak real fast. <laughs> and uh, I've got a whole lot of questions. But how do we tie this? You know, We're tying this into ECMO, of course. And a lot of things you talked about during the discussion I'm going to bring <clears throat> up, especially as it relates to ECMO. But um, your next talk, actually, regarding phenylephrine, I guess you're going to tie it in towards the end, because when a patient is critically ill, and even in the operating room during standard bypass, we use a ton mm -hmm. of Neo. I mean, we think Neo, we think of Neo like it's a baby aspirin sometimes. Mm -hmm. We don't really consider. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be very interested in your next presentation and uh, tie this into how we treat hypotension, what we should be doing. Um, because these are really important questions, I think. So with that said, if you're ready, I'm ready. Absolutely. Well, let me just say one thing, uh, because I do an awful lot of ECMO now. Uh, we are on bypass. If exactly. you're on ECMO, you, we are on bypass. If it's VA. You know, VV yeah. maybe a little bit. Right. Well, that's a lung support. But <clears throat> if you're a v VA in any way, we are on bypass. So mm -hmm. uh, when everything that I was just talking about, you know, we're on bypass. You may be in the ICU. And you may be running a little bit different pressures and a lot more drips, but uh, you're on bypass. Mm -hmm. And all the things that apply to what we are perfusing or how we are perfusing are, apply. And the renal blood supply is important to that. So that's what I'm going to tie into now and why we, I'm glad we're doing a part two because it's, under, it's good to understand the, the, the renal uh, blood supply and what happens with the kidney and why it's different. But what we're really going to try to do is, uh, as perfusionists is we try to deliver oxygen. Mm -hmm. You can circulate blood around all you want, but if there's no oxygen in it, we're not doing any good, right? So, so we're going to talk now about the delivery of oxygen. And keeping in mind what we just talked about with the, with the kidneys, well, try to, I'll try to answer these questions in this presentation, which is, you know, what is delivery of oxygen? How is it determined? Uh, how much is adequate? Uh, how do we monitor it? Uh, how do we know it's even being delivered? And is it even going to make a difference? And as I talked in the previous lecture, you know, now hopefully you understand why we might regard the, the kidneys different from any other organ. Well, so what is delivery of oxygen? DO2 is usually with a symbol that's used and defined as oxygen delivery is defined as the amount of oxygen delivered to the tissues or to the capillaries per minute. Well, how is it determined? Well, it has to be calculated. And a lot of you have seen this formula before, but delivery of oxygen is the blood flow times the content, oxygen content of the blood. So you have the amount of oxygen that's in the blood and how, at, at what rate you're delivering it, right? So it's Q, which is a symbol for blood flow. And the oxygen content of the blood is made up of two components. It's that which is attached to the hemoglobin, known as oxyhemoglobin, and the oxygen that's dissolved in the plasma. And as most of you know, the oxygen that's attached to the hemoglobin accounts for 97% of the oxygen carrying of the blood, the oxygen content of the blood. And there is another small component, 3% of it dissolved in the plasma. So the final is DO2 equals Q, which is blood flow. And the formula for the oxyhemoglobin part is 1.36 times hemoglobin times the saturation plus 0 0.031 fudge factor times the partial pressure of oxygen. And there's a conversion factor of 10 at the end to make the units work out, OK? That's what that is. But what we really want to talk about is the delivery of oxygen index. Okay? It's the same formula divided by the body surface area. But the easy way to look at that is instead of using blood flow or cardiac output, use cardiac index in that spot. And then you get an actual delivery of oxygen index, which is more important because that way we're delivering it per tissue uh, weight. So, how much is adequate? Well, let's look at a normal adult at rest. The, DO, the delivery of oxygen index ranges between 450 and 800 milliliters of oxygen per minute per meter squared. I'll show this to you. So if you use normal adult at rest parameters, let's just say the range of cardiac index for an adult 
at risk is somewhere between 2.6 and 4.2. Hemoglobin would be somewhere between 14 and 18. Saturation would be 90 to 95, and PO2 maybe somewhere between 85 and 90. So let's pick some reasonable numbers. Let's say our cardiac index is 3.5, hemoglobin is 16, 95 percent saturation, and a 90 PO2. And if you multiply that out, it tells you that most people are probably around 700, 733 millions of oxygen per minute per meter squared being delivered. So that verifies the range that I show you at the top, that most people are somewhere within that range. And I can tell you that most people are probably more in the seven, six, seven hundred range, more than the 450. Well, what is the typical delivery of oxygen index that we normally do on bypass? Well, here's some examples and uh, of a, a calculation example of what we normally do. So most of, you, most of us are flowing a cardiac index of somewhere between 1.8 and 2.6. A hemoglobin on pump would be between 7 and 10. Saturation is going to be 97 to 100 percent. And PO2, most people are probably somewhere between 150 and 450. So let's pick some, re, uh, pick some reasonable numbers here as well. Let's say you're flowing 2.2 index, your hemoglobin is 8.5, you have a 99 percent saturation, and your PO2 is 300. Well, that gives you a delivery box index on bypass of 272. Pretty big difference from the 733 that we just used. Mm -hmm. So if you compare the two, normal range on pump, and if you plugged in various different numbers there that I have on the ranges, you'd come up with a low of about 180 and a high of about 380 versus the normal adult at rest range of 450 to 800. So we typically provide about 35 percent of the DO, of the delivery of oxygen index at rest on pump comparatively, okay? How do we monitor it? Well, there is no continuous monitoring available. There is no probe and a device that you can connect to your arterial line that will give you constant real-time delivery of oxygen that you're providing. And therein lies, therein lies a need and a problem. And so it has to be calculated. Well, I don't know too many of us that are sitting there in every three to four minutes doing a calculation to see if our delivery of oxygen is, is adequate. Well, because first of all, do we even know what is adequate? And uh, if we did know what was adequate, how do we know it's being delivered? Well, this is where some research has come in, and it's closing in on some answers. Um, here's four articles, I'm going to talk about each one of them, um, listed there, where they look at specifically to delivery of oxygen to the patient on bypass. So let's look at the first one. And this was uh, Magruder, he's done a lot of research into this topic. Journal of Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery, 2017. He took 172 cardiac surgery patients and they were a one-to-one -one propensity matching score. In other words, they matched identically for risk factors. He had a control group of 88 patients and a goal-directed group of 88 patients. The control group was, was perfused at a delivery of oxygen index of 240. And the goal-directed group, he purposely perfused at a higher rate and they targeted uh, 300 and they ended up at an average of 302 on those 88 patients. <clears throat> the, goal, the control group ended up averaging an increased creatinine level, 22 percent increase in creatinine, and they had a post-op AKI incidence of 24 percent, where the goal-directed group only averaged creatinine spike 9 percent, and they had a post-op AKI incident of only 9 percent. Pretty dramatic decrease. Well, this is really the by most people's uh, standards who look at this acute kidney injury with, with respect to delivery of oxygen, this is kind of the gold standard paper. Dr. Renuzzi's done a lot of this. He's out of Italy, Annals of Thoracic Surgery 2005. He looked at 1,048 cardiac surgery patients, and they were trying to identify the delivery of oxygen in relation to acute kidney injury. And he was looking to find where is the cutoff value that we need to be above to reduce uh, acute kidney injury. So he looked and he discovered a cutoff value at 272 milliliters of oxygen per minute of cardiac index. And below this amount, patients had a two to six fold increase in acute renal failure with a, with a DIO, D2, uh, delivery of oxygen below this threshold. Anybody who was perfused below 272 had a significantly higher uh, increase in acute injury and a significantly higher mortality rate. 11 percent versus 1.7 percent of everyone who was perfused above that. This is considered where we believe the cutoff should be somewhere around 270. Dr. DeSomer and his group, and this is in critical care medicine 2011, 
looked at the same thing, and they took 359 patients. They looked at delivery volume. They also looked at carbon dioxide production to see if there was some indications there and correlations. And again, they discovered very close to Dr. Renuzzi, the previous slide, they identified a threshold of about 262 index. And they discovered that patients that were perfused below this threshold <clears throat> had a 23 percent incidence of AKI. And patients that were above this threshold had only a 7.4 incidence of AKI with predictive accuracy value of 92.5 percent. Magruder, he did 170 cardiac sur uh, surgery patients, published his reports in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery 2015, and they took <clears throat> They looked through their several thousand cases that they had done, and they wanted to find a perfect one-to-one -one propensity matching score, and they discovered 85 patients who matched perfectly with another 85 patients, but the first 85 patients did not develop any AKI at all, total non-AKI AKI group. And they found 85 control patients that matched with the uh, uh, risk factors of the first of who did develop AKI. So 85 non-AKI patients matched with uh, 85 AKI. They discovered that the uh, non-AKI group had a delivery of oxygen index was always above 230. The AKI group averaged delivery of oxygen index of about 208. If you look there on the non-AKI group, the 30-day mortality of the, of the group that had no AKI was only 5.9 percent. The 30-day mortality of the AKI group was 35.3 percent. And incidentally, I put on there the amount of uh, average amount of phenylephrine that was used. And in all of these studies, when they perfuse the patients at a higher index, they end up having to use less of a vasoconstrictor. So the bottom line was he found a result of 230 as a uh, cutoff for the development of AKI in cardiac surgery. So now I want to talk about uh, our role as perfusionists and what we can do as in bypass and maybe what we are doing. And um, I want to specifically look at uh, the role of phenylephrine because, Joe, as you were saying uh, in the break, you know, you, if, if you've been doing this as long as you and I have, you remember back in the 80s and 90s where we just didn't have phenylephrine on the pump. We just didn't have it. It wasn't in our toolbox. I remember doing two to three hundred cases a year, and I don't think I used phenylephrine once or twice the entire year. We were running blood pressures between 50 and 70, and you just don't really need phenylephrine to, to, to be in that range, right? Um, so let's take a look at what maybe has happened here. Well, this is all from the package insert, and phenylephrine, basically what it is, it's an alpha-1 adrenergic receptic receptor antagonist, right? It's an alpha-1 vasoconstrictor. It's used for increasing blood pressure in adults with hypotension resulting primarily from vasodilatation. And primarily, it's supposed to be used in septic shock or in cases of anesthesia. So phenylephrine, what did we know and when did we know it? I say that because this was patented in 1927 but came into use back in 1938. This is not a drug that's new and we're still learning about. This is a drug that's been around an awful long time. Now, I looked into the prescribing information. This is directly from the manufacturer's insert that comes inside the, uh, the, the box when you take a, a neosinephrine out in the morning. This is your package insert. And I took ex excerpts from this package insert. It's very interesting what I found. Under warnings and precautions, number one, under peripheral and visceral ischemia, the manufacturer says phenylephrine can cause excessive visceral vasoconstriction and ischemia to the vital organs. Number two, under warnings and precautions, under the uh, subheading of renal toxicity, the manufacturer says phenylephrine can increase the need for renal replacement therapy in patients with septic shock, monitor renal function. Now, let me just go back real quick. It can cause renal replacement in patients with septic shock. The purpose of it was to be used in septic shock, but yet they warn you that this is one of the cases where it can cause uh, renal failure. So number three, under geriatrics, this is very interesting. When they researched and did the FDA approval on phenylephrine, clinical studies did not include sufficient numbers of subjects aged 65 and over. Do any of us do age patients over 65? 
They did not do enough patients over 65 to determine whether they respond differently from younger subjects. Dose selection for elderly patients should be cautious, reflecting greater frequency of hepatic, renal, and cardiac function. This is right off the package insert. Number four, under specified populations, renal impairment. In patients with end-stage renal, renal disease, dose response data indicated increased responsiveness to phenylephrine. Consider starting at the lower end of the recommended dose range and adjusting. So in other words, we already know, they already know that phenylephrine is very sensitive to uh, renal vasal constriction. So in cases of end-stage renal disease, they're caution cautioning you to be even more careful. It goes on. There's number five, the pharmacodynamics. The manufacturer states phenylephrine has activity on most vascular beds. Well, they could have stopped the sentence right there because we know that. It's an alpha-1 vasoconstrictor. But they go ahead and include, including renal, pulmonary, and splanchnic arteries. So the manufacturer felt compelled to include that in this statement. And the sixth thing under pharmacokinetics, following an in intravenous infusion of phenylephrine, the observed effect of half-life was approximately five minutes. But the observed plasma terminal elimination half-life is two and a half hours. In other words, you may not see clinical effect, so your vasoconstriction and your use of it wears off very quickly, so you think that's the end of it. But this drug remains in the plasma for hours. So perhaps on a subclinical level, we're having more vasoconstriction uh, that's not evident clinically than we know about. That's just something to, uh, to look into. So back to what, what did we know and when did we know it? Well, the manufacturer has known this since 1927. But here's an interesting paper. Dr. Crosley and Clark in 1951, who had been using phenylephrine on their patients for hypotension, decided to write a little paper and do an experiment, and they published it in the Journal of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics. And their abstract, they say phenylephrine is widely used for the restoration of blood pressure, but it's frequently associated with renal impairment. In other words, this is what they were noticing. They would give their patients this new blood pressure medication. They noticed that they were having an awful high incidence of renal impairment. So they decided to do a little study. And so they said, we sought to determine if phenylephrine has a constricting action on the vascular bed of the human kidney. So they just took five normal tense of adult patients, sat them down in their office one day, they were normal healthy adults, and they gave them five milligram dose over 30 minutes. Three of them they gave an IV and two of them they gave an IM injection. And what was the result? The result was all patients had a decreased renal blood flow. And here's their conclusion, and this is important. The significant reduction of renal blood flow associated with an increase in systemic blood pressure indicates an increase in renal vascular resistance greater than that of the body as a whole. So this is what's important. If you have an alpha-1 vasoconstrictor and it vasoconstricts equally everywhere throughout the body, then the blood flow is going to distribute itself equally as well. And this is what's important to know, that it's actually more powerful in the renal vasculature, therefore blood's going to follow the path of least resistance and you're going to get a decreased blood supply to the kidneys. So Dr. Clark, although they only did five patients, it's just kind of a red flag way back in 1951 that they're just kind of waving and saying, hey, look, we've looked into this and, you know, it's a very small study and this is what, you know, we, we, we find. So this is what you need to know. This is a take-home slide right here. Phenylephrine's renal vasoconstrictic constrictive action. As I mentioned in the first uh, segment, the afferent art arterial is what leads blood into the glomerulus, right? Phenylephrine's vasoconstriction occurs on the right side of the screen, right at the afferent artery. That is the worst possible place because you now decrease blood supply to the glomerulus, you decrease your urine output, and remember, the efferent artery, which has to go on downstream and perfuse the tissues, is going to have far less blood supply going out of that. Mm -hmm. Now, here's an interesting case report. This came out of Japan in 2003, Journal of Medical Investigation. And Dr. Shimoya and his, and his group had a very unusual case where they were treating a 20-day-year-old infant who was undergoing a fundus examination. That's an eye examination of the microvasculature behind the retina. <clears throat> they gave the patient eye drops of phenylephrine during the exam as they normally would. And the blood concentration, this is a quote from their conclusion, 
the blood concentration of the drug was elevated sufficiently to contract the renal vessels, ultimately inducing renal failure. They induced renal failure on a 29-year-old infant by giving him eye drops of phenylephrine. So now let's look at some more uh, case studies. Here is a Dr. Legrand in 2013 in Anesthesiology Magazine. A quote from this article says, phenylephrine is often infused in complex surgeries with reported deleterious effects. This is the same thing Dr. Clark said in 1951, that they're using it and they, they, they've seen a common uh, path uh, repeating itself where acute kinjin injury as well as the development of lactic acidosis. And all of you know if you develop lactic acidosis, it's a sure sign of poor perfusion. So <clears throat> in, the, in the anesthesia journals, there's a lot of work that's been done on what's the best alpha-1 vasoconstrictor or vasoconstrictor in general to use during general surgery and all the patients that they do. Now, these are not bypass patients, but they often want to keep the blood pressure up in sedated patients. And these are three articles at the bottom. You can research them yourself. And a lot of these articles uh, basically state the same thing, and they're referenced there at the top. Here it says here they're comparing phenylephrine with norepinephrine. Phenylephrine infusion resulted in significant increase in splanchnic oxygen extraction. Well, if your oxygen extraction is up, that means you're not perfusing enough and the tissues have to extract more, right? Phenylephrine infusion was associated with a significant increase in lactate concentration not found with norepinephrine. Phenylephrine infusion resulted in more pronounced global splanchnic vasoconstriction than with norepi. So, why have so, so many become so focused on blood pressure uh, during cardiopulmonary bypass? And I think there's something that's probably happened in the last 10 or 20 years. But in the last 20 years, there have, the reason is there's been a number of very influential studies that have come out, primarily published in the thoracic journals where the surgeons have uh, really caught wind of these, indicating a direct relationship between hypotension and post-op AKI. So is that case closed? Low blood pressure, we need to run a higher blood pressure on pump, that's the cause of the AKI or a big contributing factor. Well, let's take a closer look. So Dr. Azo in Perfusion Magazine 2014 did a study where he was looking at increasing arterial pressure, whether or not it reduces the, the rate of acute kidney injury. And they took 300 patients, propensity score matched one to one, and they did 147 of them under what they called a high pressure group where they perfused the patients in a high pressure range of 75 to 85. Then they had their low pressure group where they perfused patients, 145 patients between 55 and 65. But they maintained blood pressure with norepinephrine. Their conclusion, the, re the rate of AKI did not differ by group. It was exactly the same, 17% versus 70%. And their conclusion was maintaining a high MAP during normothermic bypass does not reduce the risk of postoperative AKI. Let's look at Dr. Reddick's study. This was an anesthesiology, Journal of Cardiothoracic Anesthesiology, 2017. And their aim in the study was, again, to look at post-op AKI attributed to hypotension. Now, they did 1,900 patients, 1,891 to be exact, over a four-year period, 2011 to 2014. And what they discovered, what there, were, there was a threshold of, of blood pressure only below 50 millimeters of mercury. They found, so the results were there was univariable analysis in patients undergoing isolated cabbage Intraoperative hypertension on bypass was not associated with an increased risk of AKI above a threshold of 50. In other words, their patients who maintained a pressure above 50 all had the same rate of AKI. It was only below that that they saw AKI increase. Let's look at Dr. Savinka's paper. This is in Perfusion, May 2012. Now, they were trying to find the sweet spot. They said if there is a, a, a pressure range that's better than all the rest, we want to find it. So they took 122 patients, and all these patients were over the age of 70, so they really wanted to try it in the elderly. And they segmented out three patient groups, a low pressure group, they perfused between 50 and 60, a mid pressure group, which was 60 to 69, and a high pressure group, which their perfusion was 70 and higher. What did they find? No differences in renal function through post-op day three. Their urine output was the same, their serum, serum creatinine was the same, their use and need for diuretics was the same, their ICU stay was the same, and their length of stay overall in the hospital was all the same. 
So what are we to make of all this? And I can tell you there are numerous conflicting papers regarding hypotension on bypass and AKI. There's a lot of paper, papers claiming low blood pressure is causing AKI. But let's look at blood pressure. Blood pressure is a completely dependent variable. It depends upon flow and resistance. Pressure equals flow times resistance, right? You all know that. You cannot adjust pressure. You can only adjust flow or resistance, right? We have no pressure knob on our pump, but we do have a flow knob and we are able to adjust the resistance through, pharma through ph pharmaceuticals. So pressure is a completely dependent variable and blood pressure is not part of the delivery of oxygen equation, which I was talking about earlier. Delivery of oxygen depends on blood flow, hemoglobin, saturation, and partial pressure of oxygen. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in there is there a blood pressure. So what's the take home message so far on delivery of oxygen? Any research that attempts to find a relationship between blood pressure or hemoglobin levels and AKI is in reality an attempt to address renal delivery of oxygen. At a higher low blood pressure or hemoglobin is relevant only as it relates to a corresponding renal blood flow and oxygen saturation, and hence again, the renal delivery of oxygen. That's why I think you have conflicting papers. If you're running a high blood pressure and it's because of flow, then your delivery of oxygen is adequate. If you're running a high blood pressure and it's because of vasoconstriction, you're not delivering uh, oxygen to the kidneys. So that's really the, the target. So now let's go back full circle to the beginning of the first lecture and look at these AKI risk factors, reevaluate them now that we can keep in mind these four things that we've learned. Renal medulla exists in a borderline state of hypoxia. Increased oxygen delivery to the kidneys results in a proportional increase in oxygen demand. The kidneys have a high demand for oxygen due to their enormous production of new ATP, and it's the delivery of oxygen to the kidneys that's most critical. So let's look at, remind ourselves again, what are the variables involved in delivering oxygen? Blood flow, hemoglobin, oxygen saturation, and partial pressure of oxygen. Now, here's our preoperative AK risk factors, the same slide I showed in the first lecture, and I highlighted in red what I believe, and you can make argument for more than this, have one or more of these elements of delivery of oxygen factors in them. Anemia, low hemoglobin, advanced age, restrictive vasculature, decreased blood flow, left main disease, poor cardiac output, hypertension, causes renal damage and vasoconstriction, COPD, poor oxygenation, peripheral vascular disease, vasoconstriction, balloon pump, embolus, Stroke, embolus, history of smoking, poor, oxy poor oxygenation, poor LV dysfunction, poor blood flow. Meds that alter renal autoregulation, by the way, your ACE inhibitors, your ARBs, and your NSAIDs all cause the, the regulation, the autoregulation of the, of the kidneys to be disrupted. So those also have disrupting the blood flow and hence the delivery of oxygen to the kidneys. You can make argument for some of these other ones. Look at the perioperative ones, though. This is where we come in. All except maybe one of these have one or more factors in delivery of oxygen. If you have a valvular complex case, that's a long pump run, plus as you know in valve cases, you're likely to have embolus of air. Emergency operations, patients are not prepped well, maybe come in anemic. Reoperations are gonna be longer. We've always known about perhaps non-pulsatility of bypass, which again results in blood flow. Any low, flow, any low flow perfusion state. Hypothermia bypass, by the way, causes renal vasoconstriction. Long pump runs, long cross clamp times, anemic states, hemodilution, anemia, hemolysis, anemia. Red blood cell transfusions for probably hit on all four of those. Embolism, alpha vasoconstrictors, I just talked about it. Anything that's gonna congest venous congestion. Hypovolemia and going back on pump. So if you question that the delivery of oxygen is not important and plays a huge role in acute kidney injury. I think this slide, now look at the post-operative risk factors. Now, we're a little bit out of our league at this point, but when they go to the ICU, again, as I said before, if the patient gets poor hemodynamics, drops their blood pressure overnight, gets unstable, becomes hypovolemic, hypotensive, if they have to give a lot of neo or vasopressors in the ICU, if they have to put a balloon pump in, if they're gonna give meds, that alter renal blood flow if the patient becomes unstable, uh, unstable in the ICU. All of these have direct impact on delivery of oxygen. 
So my final comment on all this is that cardiac surgery is a clinical model for AKI. We live in the war zone because in this group of patients, we know postoperative AKI is going to occur, and therefore, timely therapeutic interventions for prevention and treatment of early AKI could be developed as a field and as a, a cardiac surgery uh, community. We really ought to focus on this because we live in the woods. This is happening all around us. <clears throat> in the conduct of bypass, it's really only prudent for us as perfusionists to improve the renal oxygen supply and demand relationship by continuously monitoring and augmenting renal delivery of oxygen to improve renal oxygenation. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Once again, outstanding. <coughs> outstanding. Do we have, uh, is, uh, is uh, Matt online? I think I see him. I see him back there. Supply and demand relationship by continuously monitoring, augmenting renal delivery of oxygen to so, improve uh, renal oxygenation. Yes, I'd like to introduce Thank them if we could. Appreciate it. Once again, outstanding. We're hearing ourselves. <laughs> outstanding. Do we have, uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, yeah, about a mass second. Oh, I think I see him. Are we, uh, we can hear the, uh, uh, Dave, we can hear the, the, the show off of uh, the net. So, uh, yes, I'd like to introduce them if we could. Playing it, I think, oh. on that same computer is why. He probably couldn't hear it because he was behind it. But yeah, you can see the delay if you look right here, mm. like uh, oh, I see. you know, there. I just pointed. There, I'll point again. You'll see it. Oh, there you go. Hey, Matt. Hey, Joe. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Well, thanks for having me. He probably couldn't hear. Yeah, there's a. I, I hear him, but I don't, it's, it's not synced. Oh, that's because I'm looking at this. Oh, there he is. I have to look over there. <laughs> okay. They're holding their head. All right. Madam, did you get a chance to listen hey, to John's Matt. talks? Hey, Joe, how are you? I'm doing I great. Yeah. How are oh. you? Up. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, Hold on one uh, second, Matt. We're having I, technical I hear, difficulties. They've got the, uh, the YouTube program oh, playing on the same this. computer, oh, so I hear myself and you <laughs> simultaneously. <laughs> okay, they're holding their head. All right. Matt, did you get a chance to listen hey. to John? Okay, talk? we'll eventually hey, get it. Mm -hmm. There it is. Oh, no, that's not it. Maybe just turn the sound down? Oh, down. We're good now? Okay. All right, where's, where'd Matt go? He's gone. Um, am I here? No, you're here. Yeah, you're there. It's not you. Oh, there you are. Now we're in really good shape. I see you right there. There we go. Well, thank you again. Listen, for those of you who don't know uh, don't know Matt Warhoover, um, he has a, I think I introduced you earlier. You weren't here, though. Master's of Management in Healthcare, Master's of Science in Perfusion, um, Bachelor of Science in Biology with a major in Civil Engineering. You're currently the Associate Chief of Perfusion at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Um, you're doing nearly 100 ECMO patients and 20,000 hours of ECMO annual, annually. When I met with you, you told me that you guys created a, a compensation model for your perfusion department to deal with all of this. Of course, you know, I was talking to you about wanting to start an ECMO specialist training program. We had that discussion. Um, and you're o overseeing the financials and compensation for a group of 11 uh, perfusionists on your team. So you've, you've got quite a, quite a pedigree, um, and we're really excited to hear a little bit about your financial, your thoughts about the economics of ECMO. But before you start, Matt, um, did you get a chance to listen to John's talk? I, I actually, I apologize. I just got out of a case about oh, 10, 15 minutes ago, so I didn't get to hear all of it. No, that's okay. The, well, I, I think still he's got some really interesting points about, uh, about uh, uh, renal function and acute kidney injury as it relates to cardiopulmonary bypass. But of course, you know, VA ECMO is miniature cardiopulmonary bypass, which he, you know, very, uh, I think, uh, 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 appropriately uh, w related if you will. So with that said, the, I think they've got your slides up. We're ready to go on this economics talk. And uh, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'll let you proceed. I think. All right, Joe. Yeah, we well, thanks so much for having me. 
Um, really what uh, ECMO Economics is for the longest time didn't um, really play. It, 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 the, the recent reimbursement changes as of uh, October, November of last year have really put this in the forefront of a lot of healthcare uh, systems across the country. Um, and so this talk, we're gonna go ahead and go over the historical volumes and cases uh, and the centers that perform ECMO both nationally and internationally. And we're gonna talk about the growth that we've had uh, nationally and why the, the particular effects of that growth have really become uh, a problematic for the reimbursement. So it's, a, it's kind of a, uh, a, a rationale of why we're having these changes is because of the volumes. And we can talk about that and the reasons behind that. Um, we're going to talk about why this happened, the reimbursement change, how it happened, talk about the impact and the implications of the change in the reimbursement. We're going to talk about the pushback from uh, the professional societies. We're going to talk about uh, some of the healthcare systems pushback. We're going to take a deeper dive um, into the complexity of uh, CPT codes and DRGs surrounding ECMO. Uh, and finally, I'll probably give a, a couple of real life examples of how professional and hospital billing has changed. Uh, after this um, uh, reimbursement change it, it, this last quarter. And then there's a couple ways we can talk about how providers can actually push back and use strategies, I don't want to call loopholes, but there's workarounds to, to, to get around uh, some of the uh, reimbursement changes. And so we'll go ahead and start with the uh, first slide. Okay. Yes, you'll just tell me change slides and I'll, I'll do sure. that for you. There you go. Okay. So essentially, <laughs> ECMO utilization is at an all-time high worldwide. Uh, this is primarily due to the medical uh, technology advancement, uh, the portability of the mechanical devices uh, that are needed for ECMO, and the general ease of uh, the procedure. Namely, we can, we can put somebody on VA ECMO relatively quickly with the, uh, the new cannulas and the dilator kits, if you can get to the groins, and even with chest compressions happening, it's fairly, fairly. It's a fairly simple uh, procedure to get people on. Uh, to the right, this is a, a picture of uh, an ECMO cannulation in the Louvre uh, in uh, Paris. Um, they are on the forefront of uh, doing. They call this uh, pre-hospital system, and they call it Mo ICU, which is mobile ICU. Um, they started out just in the city of Paris, and now they've gone almost 70 mile radius uh, outside of Paris to be able to handle this. Um, I, I do have a little concern, side note, I don't know how sterile that procedure is in that picture, but um, uh, they are doing it and they're doing it quite regularly. Um, Korea, Japan, China, all these, um, all those countries are, are, are starting to model this. And traditionally, you know that uh, the U.S. and their medical uh, technology and, and their, it's not so much the technology, but the way that they uh, approach how they handle the management of, of medicine is we're usually five to 10 years behind what Europe is doing because of the regulatory uh, societies that we have with the government. And so um, in France particular, uh, 2011 to 2014, um, they established this mobile ICU where they would uh, send a mobile ICU team, which was per, uh, made up of an emergency room physician uh, and some sort of anesthesiologist or CRNA and a paramedic. And this team uh, went out uh, in the field uh, to go more or less be a first responder to, to patients that went down with uh, cardiac arrest. Um, if they could not get the patient back using basic ALS and uh, drugs, that they, an eCPR team was launched 10 minutes after uh, the, the, the uh, mobile ICU team arrived. Well, they were found out in those results is they weren't getting uh, much better results than if they would have just packed the patient up and, and brought them to, back to the hospital. And so in the event, uh, 2015, they changed that model. And how they changed the model is they, they launch with the, IC, the mobile ICU team, a separate eCPR team for the uh, cardiac arrest patients. So primarily there's six people that go out into the field there's a, uh, some sort of a general surgeon or a, a cardiac surgeon that goes, 
Uh, they add another nurse anesthetist. They want to actually do the anesthesia, one to actually run the uh, ECMO machine. And they added a second, uh, a second paramedic that acts as a, an extra set of hands for the cannulation um, along that. And what they found is that they increased their sur survival rate neurologically intact, mind you, uh, from 8% to 29% in, the, in 2015. So the first three years that they did this, uh, they were only getting 8% eCPR, which in the U.S., that's what we're seeing too. We still see single digits um, for eCPR. But the French have now uh, got almost a 30% neurologically intact, intact people put on VA ECMO. Now, there's criteria, and we're not going to get into that. But what I was trying to lay out for this is that Pandora's box has been open on ECMO. And uh, the, the world, it, this is going to be the, this is going to be the new norm for us. Um, I, I think in, within the next two to three years, this is what you're going to be seeing in the U.S. What happened? The, the, the reimbursement has to change. Hold on. Hey, Matt. Next we, slide. We lost you just yeah. for a second. Um, can you okay. give that final thought one more time? I think we kind of lost. Did we lose him? Yeah, we did. We lost your voice. Yeah. On yeah. The, like the last 30 seconds, 10, 15 yeah, seconds. And, yeah. And, and so I guess the reason I go over this and why it's important is I think within the next two to three years, definitely within the next five years, we are going to have uh, the capability and probably being able to launch this. ECMO is actually going to be even higher because we have, uh, I, I don't know if you heard that, but the U.S., uh, they have single-digit uh, survival rates with eCPR, very much similar to what the French did in, in 2010 to 2014. Now the French are 29% on, on their, on, on their uh, ECMO survival when they do initiate in the field. I, I just assume that we're a little bit behind the curve only because we're not aggressive, but we are going to get there. And so ECMO is not going to go away. It's just going to increase. And then I'm going to talk about why that's a problem. It's a good thing for patients, but financially, we, we're going to have to solve that problem. So next slide. So the centers, uh, this is the CMS may close Pandora's box. And the way they're going to do this is they're going to cut reimbursement and they're going to reassign reimbursement. And we've already seen the very first stages of this uh, late last year. And so what you see here is a 28-year outlook. And this is from the, the ELSO database. Um, unfortunately for ELSO, uh, the database, not everybody contributes to this da database. So these are just probably some of the larger centers' uh, data. But we know that ECMO has grown almost 2,000% um, in the last 28 years. This data suggests a 500% in volume and nearly a 400% increase by the centers that actually do ECMO. Um, but what generally happens is as utilization of any service line in the healthcare industry goes up, reimbursement gets lowered. And the reason that is is healthcare systems get more streamlined and efficient. And during economy of scales, um, what happens is their overhead and actual costs go down for performing the service. And CMS knows this, and so they, they tend to cut reimbursement as there's more volume. Well, as you can see, reimbursement had not been cut uh, in ECMO for quite some time. In November 2018, they made their first cuts. And we're going to see uh, that probably a lot of centers are actually going to either not perform ECMO anymore or what they're going to do is they're going to be a little more stringent on um, outcomes because there is not there's, uh, there is not a lot of uh, room. Uh, if, if they can't provide this service to everybody, um, they're probably going to be very selective on patient populations of who they pick. Um, and the whole idea is that, that I, I guess I need to review that the, the reimbursement is based on DRGs. And DRGs, it's a diagnosed and related group is actually, it's a patient classification system. Uh, it standardizes uh, the prospective payment to the hospitals and in hopes uh, they it encourage cost containment uh, initiatives throughout the hospital setting. And the DRG usually covers all charges associated with that inpatient stay from the time to admission to discharge. So that DRG payment is for the entire uh, length of the ECMO, uh, the, the patient stay, what, whether they're on ECMO or not, um, if they have any time that they're on ECMO through that uh, that hospital stay, that is the DRG that they'll utilize. So you can have multiple different 
uh, problems and you can submit multiple different DRGs to get reimbursed. However, the highest DRG gets re reimbursed at, uh, at the 100% level. And then the subsequent DRGs, they fall off pretty quickly after that. So really there's no double dipping when it comes to multiple uh, etiologies. So if you, if you were a septic patient and you were on a ventilator uh, for two or three days, uh, that's, that's a pretty significant DRG. But if you went on ECMO, that's even a higher DRG. So the septic on the ventilator, that's going to get dropped off and the, the, because the DRG for ECMO is higher, it's a higher reimbursed payment, that one will actually get submitted uh, first. Um, so as you can see, ECMO is uh, on the rise and it doesn't look like it's going to uh, stop. The, while, the, while there's a little dip from 2017 to 2018, it's because all the data hasn't been processed yet into 2018. This is, a, this is just a month and a half ago. Um, they, don't, they don't have all the data yet. You have 90 days to get that data in. Um, the last thing I'd like to say in the lower right-hand corner, I, I know it's tough to see, but so uh, they, they suggest that there was 10,400 cases of ECMO in 2018. Ironically enough, CMS received almost 17,000 DRGs for ECMO. So we're just a little bit over 50% of uh, the cases are being registered in ELSO. So these numbers are, are vastly different. Um, and we know that uh, smaller centers are starting to put people more uh, on ECMO more often, maybe not by, by the volume, um, but we know that we don't, those, don't, those don't get turned into the CMS database. I'm sorry, they don't get turned into the uh, ELSO database. So these numbers are, are even more staggering if you would have the, uh, the data from CMS. Next slide. So mid-2018, a consultant group met with CMS. Um, and it, based on these meetings and the advice from the consultant group, DM, ECMO DRG codes were changed, and with it, the reimbursement for the new codes. Um, of note, only 10% of ECMO patients are over the age of 65. Um, therefore, Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement directly affects only a small percentage of the total ECMO cases. But most importantly, and I've highlighted that in the red, is uh, private health care insurance companies follow close behind with reimbursements that are tied directly to CMS. And so when CMS lowers the reimbursement for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, your contracts with Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, HealthSpring, HealthSouth, all these private insurance companies, they actually are tied um, most of the time uh, with financial contracts, a percentage of what Medicare reimbursement is. So for example, Blue Cross may be 135% reimbursement of what, Medi what a Medicare pricing is. And so when Medicare slashes their prices, uh, the private companies are, are right behind them on the heels uh, on their contracts with the, with the hospital systems. And what you can see here is that the, uh, these changes are to the to the right on the right of the screen. The blue was the old uh, DRG. It was a DRG three, and if you, it was a base of 101,000. Anytime you went on ECMO, it wasn't VV, VA, peripheral, central, thoracotomy. Um, it was just a simple DRG 003. After meeting with uh, these consultants, and we'll talk about who those consultants might have been uh, a little bit later. They broke, the, they broke it into multiple DRGs. Well, central, D, uh, central ECMO with a thoracotomy and or a sternotomy still say the same, no difference. But peripheral VA and peripheral VV ECMO drastically got reduced in their reimbursement. Um, and the reason that was is that they, they felt as though that um, the utilization of peripheral ECMO, which just happens to be 89% of uh, adult ECMO, patients uh, are cannulated peripherally. Um, this high utilization, they're really trying to, uh, they're really trying to cost contain and curb uh, uh, the total outlay of resources uh, for this particular service line. And so you can see where heart failure, cardiac arrest, VA ECMO uh, realistically um, got cut almost 80%. Now of note, VA ECMO plus a PVAD, and you see down below it says PVAD, peripheral vent, uh, ventricular assist device, namely the impella. If you put an impella in with VA ECMO, you'll get, uh, you know, the base reimbursement is $71,000. It's very ironic that if you put an impella in while on ECMO, uh, the, the reimbursement is only about a 30% cut. 
Um, the, the consultants that met with CMS um, early to mid last year um, were from Abiomed. And so it's a little ironic that um, with, and, and there's the white papers out there that says the venting the heart with the impella is better than a balloon pump. And, and there, that's a completely different talk. Uh, there was a, a great talk by Dr. Shaw um, from Vanderbilt at the, at the um, AMSEC meeting last weekend about venting strategies. And while there's no really perfect uh, venting strategy, um, CMS got the attention, uh, or Abiomed got the attention of CMS and, and it's, it's unfortunate that uh, I think it's been like that. Um, so we'll talk about it a little bit later in the deep dive on what that really means, dollars and cents. Next slide. So the if, impact and implications, uh, the SDS uh, estimates there's gonna be a 40 to 80% decrease in reimbursement. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, they're even saying that, that uh, many of the centers, especially uh, the, the smaller centers, just won't offer that service. Now, if you think about what that means, as I talked earlier about the French study, um, now they're out to a 70-mile radius outside of Paris. They started with a smaller, uh, smaller uh, footprint, and, and they've got better results, and now they're going wider with it. Well, you can imagine that if you're not within a 70-mile radius of a major medical center that does ECMO, you know, your survival rate you know, just went from 29%, and we know that's not great, but it's gonna be back to single digits again if, we, if, if, if it keeps up at this pace. Um, you can see that uh, 80, 86, 96% of all your respiratory cases were peripheral, uh, 77 of all your cardiac support cases were peripheral. And very, uh, the, the most important thing about this is that we need to look at also how many, uh, the length of stay in the hospitalization. 70 days patients were, in, uh, that was the average of all these patients that were uh, on ECMO. They only were on ECMO an average of eight days, but these are significantly large utilization, high resource utilized patients. And uh, if I get to the next, if you can go to the next slide for me. You can see that all this pushback, uh, the, the professional societies have been in touch with the hospitals and the medical centers they know this and so each one of these professional societies has written a, a, a very eloquent letter uh, to CMS to have them revisit it. They're even more, uh, they're really more frustrated that, uh, that they did this uh, reimbursement change mid-year mid cycle. Te uh, it, it very rarely uh, does, that, does that happen with CMS. They usually wait for the year uh, and come out with the next fiscal year of reimbursements, but this was mid-year and this was unforeseen. Next slide. And this is probably the best pushback uh, from the healthcare systems. Uh, I think this is the best chance that they've got. So uh, these six uh, health centers combined all their financial data uh, from ECMO, and they showed that centrally cannulated patients are just marginally more expensive than peripheral cannulation patients. And because it's, it's really not so much the OR time uh, for these centrally cannulated patients, it's once again, it's the eight days on ECMO and it's a 70 day average in the hospital. So whether you're on peripheral or central, you're, you're still a sick person and you're still gonna use a lot of resources. And so this is pretty compelling data that really there should not be that 80% uh, cut, whether you're centrally cannulated or peripheral cannulated because it just doesn't match up in, in your uh, utilization of what the hospital charges are seeing. Next slide. And so with the CPT codes, this is also what affected uh, with, the, with this new reimbursement. This is a pretty complicated slide, but uh, traditionally, like I said, you had the DRG003. Uh, it's very similar, the CPT codes were the same. Well, now the CPT codes changed as well. Now you have percutaneous, open, and sternotomy slash thoracotomy on your initiation. You have your subsequent... Uh, uh, cannula you know, repositioning uh, CPT codes, and then you've got your decannulation CPT codes, all for three, def uh, three different types of uh, ECMO uh, based on where you're cannulated. Percutaneous, open, which means a cut down, uh, cut down peripherally, and then sternotomy, of course, we all know what that is. Um, additionally, they're split up by, uh, by age bracket. They, that was always the case, 
but it just it just makes the coders in the hospital this is you know this is just more complicated stuff and the, the coding has to align with the billing or uh, I'm sorry the coding has to align with all the charting and the notes taken and the description of the op note and the management note all these things are a lot more complex and um, and there's a lot of pushback because if they all don't line up and you send the bill you don't get reimbursed next slide and so this is this is directly from CMS, and um, I just uh, this is what correlates with that DRG. This is directly from their book, and um, this is an this is an example of what reimbursement is. Um, these are actual numbers uh, for a hospital, and you can say you can see well that hundred and one thousand number um, that was for the uh, for the CMS. That's over to the right is 163. Well, how do we get from 101 reimbursement to 163? Like I spoke about earlier, this is the this is the average of a hospital system. These are actual numbers, and so they're they have a higher level of private pay uh, or uh, uh, private insurance, I should say. And so the DRG multiplier is it may be their their patient uh, their patient population. They may have a, a payer mix that's uh, clearly better than uh, uh, the CMS and Medicare and Medicaid. Remember, only 10% of the, uh, the patients on ECMO are on Medicare or Medicaid. So uh, Aetna, Blue Cross Blue Shield are all paying a percentage higher than that. And then once you average out all the patients, so the reimbursement for the DRG for this particular hospital system of central ECMO is 163,773. Whereas if you look at the other DRGs, now that the split, every single one of those patients that were in on, on, in that in the system, they should have been in the old system would have been getting 163,000. Now they're getting an average of 50,000 for people that are on peripheral VV ECMO. They're getting $12,000 for people with peripheral ECMO uh, with mechanical support, whether it be a balloon pump or um, if they're on some sort of VAD, um, you know that that uh, that not not essentially cannulated, but if they're peripheral cannulated, if they have a VAD that for some reason uh, will either cl clot off or whatever whatever the reasoning is, uh, they're only getting twelve thousand dollars as opposed to one sixty three, and then your eCPR right the pa patients that come in cardiac arrest in the O R in the uh, ER when they're peripherally uh, peripherally cannulated down in the ER the average reimbursement now is only thirteen thousand dollars for this particular hospital uh, and so there's a big there's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar loss uh, or loss of funds that they would have received. Um, than prior to uh, October 1st, 2018. And then finally, your mechanical uh, ventilatory support. If you're uh, on for a ventilator for greater than 96 hours on peripheral ECMO, remember I talked about it would upcharge to the uh, to, to ECMO. Well, now it's because if it's peripheral ECMO, it's only a $56,000 charge as opposed to the 163. Next slide. But it's funny. So here we are again. If you put an impella in, your reimbursement's 115, and uh, on 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 VA ECMO, and this would be with VV as well. Uh, so this is what the hospitals uh, uh, getting reimbursed for if they put an impella in with ECMO. Uh, the hospital, uh, this particular hospital has uh, pays twenty thousand dollars their cost for um, the impella device, and so that some of that does get passed on to the patient. Uh, but you're, you're more or less putting a $20,000 uh, device in to, uh, to obtain almost a, another $60,000 in reimbursement. Um, and, you know, we all know that a person, they're not going to put this type of device in somebody that's not neurologically intact. So the patients that come from the ER uh, that are uh, VA emergently cannulated, until they, until they get a head scan, uh, you know, and, and a lot of these times we don't know how long they're down, um, they're not going to get this impella uh, put in at this particular hospital until uh, they can get a neuro exam. Next slide. And this is an extremely uh, busy slide as well, but I just uh, the, we've talked about that far right uh, on the uh, MSDRG reimbursement, but the the middle column, which is hospital billing, this is a daily charge that the hospital receives for the management in the ICUs of ECMO. So there's, uh, an, there's an initial, uh, the very top line is the initial veno-veno cannulation and, and management of that patient for that day. It's a daily charge. 
and then you've got the uh, the maintenance every other day. It's the twenty-seven thousand dollar charge. Then you've got uh, an initial uh, ECMO for VA ECMO. There's a twenty-eight thousand dollar charge that goes along from the hospital side. To, uh, it's the CPT billing, and then there's a twenty-seven thousand dollar subsequent daily charge for every day that they're on VA ECMO. None of this has changed. And I want to say uh, that this is really the only reason that uh, hospitals are actually even doing ECMO anymore. It's because they can actually offset the cost of, uh, of the, uh, the DRG cut with the CPT uh, cut. Of note, CPT uh, charges also get cut. They usually happen two to three years after the DRG. So we also need to anticipate that these are also going to be uh, in, in decline as well as far as the reimbursement numbers. And then finally, the professional billing side to your uh, to your far left, those are those are professional charges to the MDs. Those are uh, procedural charges, if you will. So you've got a, an ECMO uh, VV percutaneous cannulation, the top one. You've got a um, uh, that's your initial. You've got a um, a cut down a VV ECMO centrally is the second number. Uh, the third one is a uh, is a management a, a repositioning of the venous uh, a venous venous ca catheter, so if they have to uh, uh, reposition a neck cannula or a groin cannula, that's a professional fee uh, charge that, that that's a, it. Uh -oh. <clears throat> hmm. Hold on, what happened? What happened? Cart just. Now there's multiple charges with this change. Next slide. And finally, uh, the pushback from the from the providers. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a cat and mouse game. Um, when you get these reimbursement changes, everybody uh, you know has to be uh, reactive. Um, a lot of the people were already uh, expecting this. Uh, this is not something that's new to cardiac surgery. Uh, over time, reimbursement for cabbages, mitral valves, aortic valves, they've all declined over the years. Um, physicians knew, you know, know that as utilization goes up, reimbursement uh, goes down. And so there was some, uh, some providers were on, the, were on the cutting edge of trying to find ways to, uh, if you will, uh, have alternative cannulation strategies and alternative management strategies to get around these reimbursement issues that we've just recently had. Uh, there's a sport model. It's an actual cut down uh, on the subclavian artery and uh, a cannulation, a peripheral cannulation in the neck uh, to get your venous access. So you can actually do a VA ECMO uh, with a cannula in the neck as their drainage cannula, and there'll be actually a cut down to the axillary artery that's actually considered central cannulation. And so you, you kind of get by with that without the sternotomy, uh, thoracotomy. They've gotten a little more descriptive, and they've come out with another set that you can see uh, in that past slide I have the CPT code. It says thoracotomy, sternotomy. Well, some of the docs will just do what they call just a, a, a sport model, which will just do a, a semi-sternotomy, a hemi-sternotomy, hemi and then they'll go ahead and sew that in centrally. It's not as invasive, um, and, and you can get by with that. There's centralized venting. Instead of putting in the PVAD, the impella, They'll do a thoracotomy approach and put a, a, a 22 or a 20 um, vent. Uh, usually it's a small venous cannula. They'll place that either in the uh, superior pulmonary vein or they'll actually sometimes they just directly uh, vent the, uh, the apex of the heart depending on what the long-term strategy of that patient is, whether they're a VAD patient or they're going to be a, uh, a transplant. And then uh, once again, we've, we've seen an uptake at Vanderbilt with our impella utilization primarily because we know that the, the $20,000 outlay is worth a $60,000 reimbursement on the back end of our ECMO patients. Finally, uh, one other strategy that they're, uh, that they're utilizing is instead of keeping patients uh, on, a, on a vent for seven to eight to 10 to days uh, while on VV ECMO recovering whatever the, uh, whatever the etiology is, if they're, if they're going to look like they're gonna be on a ventilator for more than five days, we, trach, we, we get a trach consult at uh, day three, and they're usually trached by day five. A trach along with any peripheral ECMO automatically upticks uh, the, re, uh, the DRG back to that 003. So we're traching a lot more patients a lot earlier. 
um, it, I wouldn't say we're tracking more patients. We're just tracking patients earlier to get that DRG charge to make sure that that's what it is. And finally, um, it's, it's all about show me the money. Uh, the, the, the hospitals are having to play this game with CMS to try to, you know, essentially uh, get their get money back. It was used to be a, a, a really big win. Cardiac surgery was a big win, big financial uh, win for any hospital system. ECMO was the same. Um, I can tell you Vanderbilt alone, uh, we, we, we estimated our numbers. If we did the same volume as we did last year, uh, as, we, as we'll do this year, as we'll do this year based on that reimbursement model, we're, we're down 45% of what our profit margin was before. And, and, you know, that, that, that profit margin, yes, you think, oh, it's still, it's a really good profit margin still, but to have that at this institution, uh, your cardiac surgery, your neurosurgery, your ECMO, uh, your orthopedic, all those cash cows at this in institution have to go ahead and, you know, cover for a lot of, a lot of the programs, and a lot of the departments that aren't cash cows or that do, that lose money. And so it, it, you have to, you can't just look at a one department or one service line and look at the net. It's the net net of the entire institution and enterprise wide. Thanks for having me, Joe. You want to go to the last slide? The last slide? Yeah, last slide. Oh, that was your last slide. I apologize, Joe. I forgot to tell you last slide, but that essentially that's what I was. That's what I'm uh, referring to is that you know the hospitals are screaming. You know they they want to show me the money, and you know with this huge influx of uh, you know of, of ECMO, it's a medical onslaught. So uh, there was a there was kind of a, uh, uh, a I want to say a, a blog, and that's what they entitled ECMO. Um, it was. Uh, economically challenging medical onslaught. And I thought that was pretty uh, unique uh, that that's how they, uh, that they titled their blog. Well, very good. Um, listen, that was, I, I'll tell you what, between, um, here, what's going on? Uh, between your presentation, John's presentations uh, today, I think this has ended up being probably the best perf web we've ever done. I mean, I, I don't know what you think, Min and, and Brianna, you've seen a couple of our programs mm -hmm. before. Um, this was clearly the best. Um, Matt, could I ask a question? Could you let us take just a, maybe a two minute break? Uh, use yep. the little boys room because I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I, I kind of need to go. I'm getting old. You know how that is. I think John, you might need to go too. Um, <laughs> and then we're going to open the phone lines up and, uh, and take some questions. I have a whole bunch of questions. I know my colleagues, the panel has a whole bunch of, have a whole bunch of questions. And let's take uh, five minutes and maybe 20 minutes to just hash all of this out and solve all the world's problems. Sounds great. Okay, great. Perfect. So five, five, uh, two, like two and a half minutes and that's it.
Okay, Ed. Well, welcome, <laughs> welcome back, everybody. Okay, and I think we're going to bring Matt back in on the uh, on the Skype call. And welcome. I'll tell you what. This is. I was telling the panel here that uh, in the in the year that we've done this, now our second year. This is by far, as far as I'm concerned, the absolute best webinar we have ever done. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know that I can do any. I don't. I may quit. <laughs> I think I'm just going to quit at the end of that. That's it. I'm going. I'm leaving. I'm going to move on to your houseboat, and you can stay right. here. You and Matt. You and Matt. Matt can stay on Skype for, you know, in perpetuity, and you can just stay right here. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, we've got a, a bunch of questions. Um, let's start with John over here. Uh, and I know you didn't see a lot of his talk, Matt, but a lot of it was uh, regarding uh, O2 delivery and acute kidney injury, and he he and focused a lot also on the use of phenylephrine, which I was surprised about the norepi. We'll talk about that, but how phenylephrine affects it as well, and how we're how the kidney actually operates. I mean, it was a it was a hell of a of a physiology lesson, really, anatomy and physiology lesson. But it was it was targeted towards not just the kidney's functions, but how the kidney operates in the world that we put it in. So one of the questions is, someone who's running an FIO2 of 100% on bypass, um, is that detrimental to the kidneys provided there's adequate blood flow? What would be the PO2 that they're running? Well, they're saying they're running an FIO2 of 100%, so they're not calling in, they're doing a question over, well, over line. Well, so. if, you're, if you're setting on your blenders 100%, um, you can assume, you need to know what your P, PO2 is. But I, can I would figure it's, let's say 350, it's 400. It's probably 350, 400, maybe higher. And you should not be running PO2s, high PO2s. You should be running PO2s probably in the mid 100s. Uh, studies for many years going way back to the 80s and 90s show that once you get a PO2 above 200, you're basically oxidative uh, injury. Your oxygen free radicals go directly up. And I'm not quite sure how we got to the point of running 350 and 450 and 500 uh, PO2s because you can only saturate the oxygen. And, and all of us sitting here are awake, warm, active, which our patients are not. They're cold and asleep and, and paralyzed. We only have a PO2 of about 90. Mm -hmm. And our saturation is about 97 to 98%. Once you saturate the hemoglobin, everything over and above that is micro bubbles in the, in the plasma. That's what PO2 is. That's how a laboratory device works. It doesn't look at the red cell. It looks at the plasma and detects how much micro uh, oxygen bubbles are in the plasma and figures out what that's what the PO2 is. So and other than having a margin of safety above mm -hmm. uh, because we are using an artificial device, it's and not as reliable. Hello, you're on the air. Go ahead, keep talking. It's not as reliable Hold as our lungs second. are. Hold on a second. Hello? We need a margin of oxygen. We need a margin of error, which could be maybe 50 to 80 points higher than what our, our, our normal at rest awake adult would be. So I would say between 150 and 180. And I'm not sure what you're accomplishing over and above that. But what thing for sure is you are causing oxidative injury to the kidneys at elevated PO2s. We need to talk about that some more. That's a very good point that I, 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 I have always felt otherwise. But anyway, you're on the air. Uh, caller, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name's Kyle. I've been following y'all's uh, webinar, uh, and I had a question for Matt. Yes. Matt, this question's uh, for you. I was wondering what's the best way to educate uh, economic decision makers on the changes of ECMO reimbursement? All right, so I, I, if I understand the question, you, you want to know how to educate um, people within your own hospital system, correct? Yes. So uh, I, it, that that that's that is really the crux of the problem uh, because change. How, so there's not only a financial change, but that has to correlate with a, a an actionable item, uh, meaning your your the provider level has to change, and the only people are going to be able to run those numbers. You need to get your financial people, uh, whoever runs the the reports on um, you know. The way that the way that we do it is we run reports by by month on certain DRGs 
And so now you've got a list of DRGs that, that, uh, that you, you can have, what CMS has given us. You run all those DRGs and you see what your reimbursement is and you'll see what your payer mix is. And then you'll be able to tell exactly what margins you have per DRG. Once you, once you have that and then you go back historically and you can take it before they made this reimbursement, you can see what kind of margin uh, you know, that you're left with compared to what you used to have. Then once you get those numbers, that's when you really have to have the, uh, you know, unfortunately, a pretty high level meeting with uh, the, uh, the, you know, the CFO, the CEO, COO, the hospital, and then they have to bring in the actual MDs uh, and say, you know, look, this is what it looks like. Um, do you have any thoughts? And that's, that's kind of what we did. Um, luckily, we had a couple of the MDs that were uh, pretty ahead of the curve. They knew what this. They knew about what this was going to be like, and so they had already changed their practice uh, ahead of time to go to that sport mile to get more aggressive with the traking. But it, it, it's really tough uh, to to more or less go from what I want to call the bean counter side of the hospital and the provider side. It, it, it is, although they should play well together, and they are in the same. They're all on the same team. A lot of times, their circles don't really interact at all. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Good question. Thank you so much. Okay, so that was very good. So, Matt, Matt, do you, I mean, here we are talking about AKI, and now I know we, the, the mix of the two subjects is probably a little, a little, little, little uh, uh, disjointed, but nevertheless, um, if you have a patient who's on ECMO and then they go into AKI and they're going to be in the hospital for a long time, given these reimbursement challenges, how is that going to affect everybody? Well, it, it, once again, um, uh, uh, what I did hear of John's talk, and, and just a little bit of, of, a, of a, a side note on that, you know, the most expensive thing that we do um, in the U.S. as far as medical is uh, uh, ES, ESRD, uh, end-stage renal disease. Mm -hmm. It's the dialysis. Mm -hmm. That is the number one consuming uh uh, of economic resource in 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 healthcare, um, every single dialysis patient. Uh, this is I, this this information is a little dated, 2016 maybe. It's it costs nearly seventy eight thousand dollars annually for someone to be on dialysis. And you think of how many people are on dialysis across the country. So j to John's point, it, you know we need to be concerned about this AKI because it, it is it is not an insignificant. Um, it's not insignificant when it comes to finances. It's not insignificant when it comes to um, when it comes to people's uh, you know outcomes and and their quality of life. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I gave a talk on, on a similar financial implication of uh, of AKI a, a couple of years ago. And you know someone that's on dialysis, the average lifespan once you're on end stage renal disease and you are on dialysis, it's 10 years. That's mm -hmm. average lifespan. So it doesn't matter if you're 26 or you're 76. The average is 10 years. That, that's that's uh, disconcerting at best. So uh, uh, getting back to this issue of, um, of, uh, of oxidative stress with the oxygenation, the PO2, if it's 0 0.003 milliliters of oxygen, I guess that's per 100 mLs of, of mm. blood, um, for your PO, for the, the, the volume per PO2, um, then 200 to 400 doesn't seem like a whole lot of volume to me. So right, that's the I whole, that's don't the, 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 when you, you're get the... Well, you're talking about the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. 90% of the oxygen carried by the blood is attached to hemoglobin, 90% mm -hmm. of it. The other 3% is whatever got dissolved in the plasma. Mm -hmm. Whatever got dissolved in the plasma is what a laboratory device looks at to determine what the PO2 is. Right. So that those dissolved bubbles in the plasma, the higher your PO2 is, the larger and more of them, the bubbles there are of oxygen in the plasma. What good are those bubbles in plasma doing you? Well, they may not be doing you any good, but here's, I guess, my take on this, and, and, and uh, it's a good discussion point, but um, are they actually doing harm? In other words, you're saying they are, and I'm trying to understand how they are. So, 
you know, if you have a PO, if you, there's people that say you should run your FIO2 at 100% on bypass, right, I've on seen pump, that. no matter right. what, because nitrogen is an inert gas. Mm -hmm. So as you reduce it and you blend in room air, mm -hmm. you're adding nitrogen into the mix and any bubbles you do have are less likely then to be absorbed should you have any real micro, micro air bubbles going on. That's their argument. Right. Um, but so, uh, you know, the, the difference in volume from 200 to 400 on a PO2 of the number of those bubbles, yes, it's double, but is 200 safe and 400 is unsafe? I mean, does that really make, it doesn't make sense to me. When you look at the amount of oxygen-free radicals generated, it's huge. It is huge. Yeah, it's huge. There, there, there's, I'm going to lose a bet because of this. So well, um, I'm going to have to look this you, up. You can look it up. You it. can look it up and see. What is the number one thing that you see on TV for taking this and taking that and drinking green tea? It's reduce oxygen-free radicals. Yes. And that's, and that's us. Reducing oxidative stress. Right. And that's mm -hmm. us at PO2s of 90. Mm -hmm. We're bre they're talking about, you know, people like us. With P when you have PO2s, the higher they go, that those oxygen of dissolved in the plasma becomes free radicals. Mm -hmm. They just escalate. Okay. And those cause inflammatory response and tissue damage. So I need to ask Matt a question regarding this. Matt, you do a lot of ECMO. And now we think we do a lot of ECMO, but you do, you do, I forgot what it was now. You had a, uh, I don't have the paper in front of me. It was a lot. Okay. We did 98, 98 but, patients in about 20,000 hours last yeah, year. 20,000, that's a lot of ECMO, but, okay? But let me, let me just interject something. If we're talking about cardiopulmonary bypass mm -hmm. on the OR, then the entire body gets that high PO2. On ECMO, peripheral cannulation, or even central, and the lungs are contributing perhaps desaturated blood, and we're mixing the two, that's different. That's a good point. That's, no, that's different. Fair. Because that's if fair. you draw a radial sample, if I'm sending, we all leave our FIR2 on 100% on ECMOs. No, no, we, but that's that. not my and, question. That's okay. not where my Because I, I if it gets mixed in the yes. body, and you radial is yeah. only a PO2 of 70, yeah. but you have to send 450 PO2 through your ECMO to get that, yes. then you have to get that. Yeah, I understand yeah. that, and that's fair, but that's not really what my, my, okay. my question is. So if you have a patient on ECMO who has zero LV function, cardiac function is absolutely zero, and you're cannulated uh, in the subclavian, for example, what kind of PO2 do you run on ECMO? Um, we, we'll, we actually, uh, we'll actually, we treat we treat three things. Um, we we treat the uh, the S SPO2. We look for the pulse ox. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you're on VA ECMO, a lot of times you don't have uh, a, a pulse oximeter, so you have to be reliant on on your blood gas. Um, but if you do have some pulse utility, we'll look to that. Two, we look for lactate, and three, we look for urine output. And those are those are the clinical markers that we look. Uh, to make sure that we think we're we're adequately uh, giving enough DO2 um, delivery of oxygen, you know, the the and, and so we don't want to we don't want a delivery and a consumption mix, mismatch. But to John's point, we we have now found that we don't do 100 percent we don't do 100 percent all the time on VA ECMO because of the reasons John's talking about. Okay. Uh, we will we'll we'll have 90 percent, 80 percent, 70 percent. Uh, we we have a hard stop at 60% on our FiO2 on VA ECMOs. Um, that's our hard stop without a, a, a consult from a, a physician. A perfusion won't go below that. But that would uh, depend on what your out your your FI, your PO2 out is, right? Yes. Well, okay, no, so well and we don't well we don't uh, and we, we don't look what the PO2 uh, output of our oxygen is. We look primarily for peripheral cannulating in the groin. We look with the right radial gas is that's what that's what we're that's what we're uh that's our that's that's our uh sweet spot of what we look to to dial in our fio2 but but obviously you you know i mean let's just hypothetically say you had true dual circulation the lungs were yep. working well you wouldn't want to pump uh blood into the into the femoral artery that's going to feed the kidneys that has a po2 of, of 40. absolutely right absolutely correct so, so you do make but, sure you may not do a circuit gas, but you make sure it's red. That, yeah, well, at, well, actually, we, we will do we will do a circuit. So every time we do a, a circuit, we, every time we go down by ten percent, we get a right radial gas, and we get a, a, an out output of what our uh, oxygen is putting out. That's absolutely correct, Joe.
Okay, good. So now back to back to you, John. A any concerns about using mannitol in your pump prime? Well, there's been multiple papers come out about that. If you um, uh, use mannitol in your prime, what you're doing is when I showed the slide about you're not affecting renal blood flow, but you're affecting the hyperosmolality of the, of the filtrate that goes down the tubules. So if the osmolality that's going down the tubules is higher, you're going to reabsorb less back over into the blood, and therefore your urine output's going to be greater. You're going to have a higher amount of water output. So if you're seeking to uh, decrease third spacing, and you're going to take more water out of the intravascular space, hoping to bring some third spacing back, then your mannitol, I think, is serving your purpose. Mm -hmm. um, what about crystallize? Because I've heard people argue that you get you can get crystals in the uh, in the distal tubules when you use mannitol, and that it has, you know, that it can become a, a obstructive. I mean, have, is that anything you have ever seen or addressed? I haven't. I didn't study much about that particular topic, but that would be an interesting topic to talk about. Okay. You know, to see. What about you, Matt? You you have that uh, at all? Where'd Matt go? There he yeah. is. Okay, uh, hey, you're back. No, the only thing uh, we do have we we do um, make we we do dilute our mannitol before we inject it. Um, uh, and you know, we've all seen the crystals inside the the vials of mannitol, and I think that's what uh, people are concerned about. We uh, we all our mannitol comes with a filter on the lure lock and. Um, I, I, I don't know much about uh, what, what's in the physiology of the kidney. I'm just, I, I know I am concerned about the crystals that I'm actually putting in. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I can keep asking, I can ask questions for like a million years. Brianna, Min, let's get you in on this conversation here. You guys have any questions for these gentlemen? Uh, I have like a comment sized question for John uh, regarding his second presentation. Um, the literature you presented and that I've come across states that uh, when administering uh, phenylephrine during CPB that it can, it affects the capillary levels even though it restores the perfusion pressures. And so um, I think the main concern of a perfusion is, is maintaining a mean pressure. And so like the first thing they do when they walk into an OR is look at the mean pressure to make mm -hmm. sure everything's good. So even though many of the literature is indicating that the use of phenylephrine can decrease myocardial mitocardial, mitocardial, mitocardial oxygen. Mitochondrial? No, that's, that's myocardial. Yes, My, myocardial. Yeah. Yes, oxygen demand decrease that and decrease um, nutrient delivery to organs. How do you think that will affect our scope of practice regarding the phenylephrine since we're now starting to focus more on AKI during CPB? Well, what we need is a better alternative, and a better alternative is vasopressin, by far. I uh, spoke with nephrologists, uh, uh, pharmaco uh, ph um, pharmacists, PhD pharmacists at our hospital, and we do an awful lot of ECMO also, and I asked them this very question. We need a vasoconstrictor that's an, uh, an alpha-1 constrictor. The great thing about vasopressin, it's not an alpha-1 uh, vasoconstrictor, it's a V1 vasoconstrictor. Vasopressin has its own uh, receptor sites on the vasculature. And so it is less powerful, uh, less vasoconstrictive of the renal arteries. So it's a much better alternative to, to phenylephrine. And, um, you know, the, the thing would be okay if it vasoconstricted equally everywhere. Right, if, if an alpha-1 vasoconstrictor like Neo vasoconstricted equally everywhere and your blood pressure was the same, it would have to find its way equally everywhere. But it's more powerful on the renals than it is in the, per, in the peripheral vasculature. So therefore, it shunts blood away from, the, away from the kidneys. And you're absolutely right. The surgeons and other people in the room want to see that map on the screen of 70, um, which is a great number to look at. But what's really happening? Where's the blood going? And as we really can see, it's not going to the renals very well. Mm -hmm. And it, it can ill afford any drop in blood pressure. Remember, the PO2 in the medulla is 20. What if you drew a blood gas on your arterial blood side and you found that your PO2 was 20? Everybody would hit the roof. That's how the medulla is. I wouldn't is. tell them. You wouldn't tell them. <laughs> but so the medulla lives at that PO2, so it has no margin for any of us to decrease a delivery of oxygen to the, to the kidneys. There's just no margin of error. And we probably push that envelope every day. That's just know? fascinating. Yeah. Min? So, um, like, with all the research and studies that you've, you know, done with your renos and 
um, relating to cardiopulmonary bypass. Is there anything specific or key things that you look for that you didn't look for or, or would use in your scope of practice daily now for, you know, preventing and uh, making sure that, you know, the patients don't, you know, get AK, AKI? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is um, have people do some more research. These are four articles that I found. There's not a whole lot more that have been done that show that delivery of oxygen is what's important. There are an awful lot of perfusionists that I spoke to that said, oh yeah, delivery of oxygen is what's important, not blood pressure. But then they go back to work the next day and I'm not sure they're, they're doing a whole lot different. Mm -hmm. um, their subject is so vast. Mm -hmm. There's so much we could study about it. Um, I think if we can tone down the rhetoric that it's all about blood pressure uh, and it's more about delivery of oxygen. Um, and if we could actually have a way to continually monitor the delivery of oxygen that we're sending, because if you do have uh, a low hemoglobin, that can be made up for in blood flow. Just right. look at the delivery of oxygen calculation. Mm -hmm. If you did have a low PO2 or a low saturation, that could be made up with a higher hemoglobin and a higher blood flow, right? So your total delivery is four components are, are there, right? So you can have something go low, like if you do happen to hemodilute your patient for some reason by accident, uh, you used a lot of crystalloid cardioplegia or something, and your hemoglobin dropped, well maybe you need to turn your blood flow up for a while until you hemoconcentrate that off and get back down. And a live, continuous monitor of DO2 would show us what's going on with that. So that's where I think we're the next paradigm, which was the first uh, slide that I said, is where perfusionists really need to be looking is what are we delivering? Because that's the, that's the business we're in. Mm -hmm. And how do we actually measure what we're delivering? Which brings me to this point, is on the, um, on the, on the pressure, okay? So you had mentioned several things. Leave a fed, which is amazing to me, you said was better to, in protecting renal blood flow than was neosinephrine. And if, if I heard correctly, is that correct? Yes, but not by much. Not by much, okay, because, yeah. you know, we've always heard leave a fed, leave them dead. You know, that's kind of been the, mm -hmm. you know, it, and if you, once you get up to 28 mics of leave a fed, uh, yeah. you've got a, a predicted 100% mortality. It's if a, it has to, if it stays there for any duration. It's a powerful alpha vasoconstrictor, and it's going to do a lot of similar things as, as Neo's going to so, do. Yeah. So yeah. getting the leave a fed and the Neo down, mm -hmm. if you have a patient, get to the ICU on ECMO, get the flow up as high as you can, but get those down preferentially over and keep the vasopressin up, mm -hmm. is what you're saying is a mm -hmm. much better alternative to managing the blood pressure. Matt, do you see that too? Hey, hey Matt, I have a question for you. Uh, no, how, please, how, go ahead. How much um, uh, uh, limb uh, malperfusion do you see? Cold fingers and toes? How, how frequent do you think you see that? Because we see it very often in ECMO. Well, so initially, uh, I don't know if it, it, which which com, comes first. Is it your limbs? Is it your right. is your you know fingers and toes ischemia? Is that because of low cardiac output right. prior to ECMO? Right. Because uh, right. essentially, when we first go on ECMO, it, it, I'm I, I'm right with, with like what you said. I'm wanting to get my flows up, and you know all of a sudden because a lot of the times they are on these rocket fuel drips when you first put them on. Uh, you know, you've got pressures, you know, systolics in the 130s, means over 100. And, you know, it's it's almost imperative that you actually get the those drips down. And, you know, our, our nursing uh, colleague cohorts, you know, when they're managing their patients in the ICU, ECMO is a completely different beast. You can control their cardiac output. So um, I want to say in the outside hospitals that when we go pick patients up, we do see a lot more of uh, the, the, you know, the purple or the black digits day three, day four. Um, but really in our ICUs, we make a really concerted effort to actually get, get everything off and we'll actually tolerate a lower blood pressure uh, mm -hmm. for the exact same reasons. Um, there's a, a connect system, uh, Levanova has a connect system that does a continuous DO2. Uh, we don't utilize it. Uh, we've looked at it. It's just the finances of it are, are really tough, but that's that, that's exactly what uh, what we do. Is, uh, it's uh, Bob Groom uh, out of uh, Maine mm -hmm. and has a really good paper on the DO2 and perfusion. I think he, it's published in uh, in Perfusion the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I reviewed that article. It's an excellent article. And yeah. the the thing about whether it's low cardiac output 
or the rocket fuel that they're on. Well, if you take a patient that has low cardiac output, which is the reason we put them on ECMO, well, enter in ECMO, now you no longer have a poor cardiac output because we can control that. So now we need to, what do we normally do? We go on ECMO, we immediately decrease the ventilator, right, to decrease barotrauma. Well, we also should immediately decrease the drips, especially the vasoconstrictors. I see patients on a dozen drips, five of them might, have, might be an alpha-1 component. And we need to turn those down because now we're able to control and immediately correct the poor cardiac output. So we should be opening these patients up right away as far as their cold digits is concerned because you know once that starts, it's almost invariable that it's gonna to continue to get worse. So if we can immediately open them up by reducing the alpha-1 vasoconstriction and increase our blood flow. So what you guys are doing is, is what I'm, I'll be pushing for as well, wherever I go. I don't see that you know, necessarily all that often either. Yeah, that's, 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 I think, very true. Are you guys using, because one of the things we have as an issue, and Brianna and, and Min, please chime in on this, is that a lot of times we just simply don't have enough flow mm -hmm. to accomplish all of this. So how mm -hmm. often are you guys doing exotic cannulation, VVA, VAA, you know, VVAA, you know, in order to achieve the flows that, really you need all and the, the drainage you need all the time so you're all doing this frequently we, we put in additional venous cannulas right away matt yep uh, we will uh we don't necessarily put in additional cannulas uh uh going in, during like va ecmo but our uh if uh what we will do is we will put we'll go to vav because if we can't if we can't get the lungs or, or continue to, uh, to eject okay, yeah, and the lungs go bad, you know, 24, 48 hours later for whatever the reason, whether it was fluid overload, whether it's a, a SERS uh, effect to the oxygenator and, and they go white it out. Many times we'll, we'll take a quarter inch line off the back of our oxygenator and we'll feed it back into a Mac line. Or if they don't have a, a large uh, bore uh, line, uh, we'll go ahead and, put it back, uh, it, it, we'll put a, a Femplex cannula in the IJ. And so we'll run VAV um, mm -hmm. a lot of times. Um, mm -hmm. we, okay. we tend to try to tank up our patients with volume the first 48 hours uh, to, to do exactly what John says. We don't mind if they open it. We want them to open up. We want that acid. We want all that to wash out. We want to get good perfusion distally uh, to all, you know, good perfusion everywhere. And if we have to tank them up, to do that, we will do that because we know that uh, many times ECMO is not a short. We're not we're not turning people around in 24 hours. It, you know, it's it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So we'll tank them up, get every, get everything washed out, get all the tissues good and perfused, and then over a period of the next two to three days, usually on day two, day three, we'll start uh, you know diuresing them either with CRT or if their kidneys you know are functioning well, uh, you know we'll really push uh, you know. Uh, You'll, we'll use diaril, we'll use Lasix, um, you know, to, to get the volume back off of them. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, something that you said is about, you mentioned it, is uh, a pulsatile flow, but also back to this issue of pressure. So a lot of, if you, if you talk to the folks that use uh, TCD, which also Bob Groom was a big advocate of that in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, and uh, everybody thought he was crazy, including me, but he ended up being right. But you have a capillary opening pressure, particularly mm -hmm. in the brain. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, I don't care how much flow you have, if you don't have enough of a pressure head mm -hmm. to open that up, you're going to end up with a stroke. So we save the kidneys and we have a vegetable patient. So what do, how do we address this? Well, we, we need to have uh, line in the sand for pressure as well. You know, even though blood pressure is not part of the delivery of oxygen equation, you need pressure to to drive blood to microvasculature. You know, and um, do we know what the minimum driving pressure would be? Uh, I don't know. Do we do we or not? I don't know. We've well, without measuring without measuring yeah. the TCD, without measuring uh, Doppler looking at the middle cerebral yeah. artery. I don't think we ever really know if right. we're actually perfusing the brain. I, I know. I know the um, the NEARS is not a perfect device, or those uh, saturation monitors are not perfect. But I'm a kind of an advocate of putting that on four different locations in the body on someone in ECMO: one on the head, 
the right arm, the left arm, and whatever limb is cannulated. And if you see, you, you may not be able to live and die by the actual number, but you can be pretty confident about a trend that changes. Really? And we've seen where we had a patient who got turned, he was essentially cannulated, he got turned, and as he came back, the nears in his right arm dropped way off, way off, 10, 20 points, because the cannula became malpositioned, it turned inside the aorta. Wow. And his right side was much malperfused. And um, so that's a reason why if you have one on the head and right arm, left arm, and whatever l leg is cannulated, you can learn a lot from, from the nears. The natural numbers are placement dependent, how much adipose tissue the patient has, uh, oh, you know, yeah, the actual number. But if you get them on there in a good spot and you get your baseline numbers and you start seeing changes, we're on bypass. We're perfusing the patient. We should not have areas that are malperfused. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So if something goes wrong, maybe we had a clot embolus, the cannula position changed, we should be able to see that. And Con I, venous I, congestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the on nearest an pump, especially when they pick the heart up, right. or even on a circ graft on pump when we have our venous return go down. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, now I feel bad all those cases that I've done where they pick the heart up and I've just accepted a low flow. And well, you do. For how long, you know, and what? But what do you do? You know, that was one of the risk factors. If you noticed on uh, the perioperative list, was venous congestion. I was, was one way north, down on the right or the bottom. Um, we don't, you know, we don't live in an isolated world. We have so many multifactorials, and we're working with our partners in the OR, right, that have to do their job as well. Sure. And so, yeah, you got to uh, get the grafts done. You can't just well, leave the arteriotomy open or don't graft it because you can't. You can't tolerate the, the low flow or, uh, at the time or, or poor venous return at the time. My thought would be if we were living and dying by delivery of oxygen and all of a sudden the surgeon turns the heart over, we could say, hey, our delivery of oxygen just dropped below the threshold of what we know being safe, as opposed to saying, well, I just can't flow. You know, that's right. But now what you have mean? a concrete yes. thing that you're giving a global delivery of oxygen to the entire body that is now below a known threshold that is going to cause some problem, at least to the kidney we know. That, so that's, that's why I think that's why I think we if we could have a way uh, to live real time monitor delivery of oxygen leaving our arterial line, we might learn something about if we if we could measure it in various locations. It could help, because but at least you can have DO two great here, mm -hmm. but crummy there, right? So we you, you, it does have to be there can't be one single place. Now we can give them obviously this is what's coming out of the arterial cannula, right. so that's right. really what you're talking about mm -hmm. here. Okay. Well, there was one study that that took that took a Swan Gans catheter and put it into the into the renal vein, and sampled throughout bypass on animals though renal vein oxygen saturation, and learned an awful lot about this delivery of oxygen factor. That as we begin to go below a certain threshold, the renal vein extraction of oxygen goes way way up. You did so, read a lot of papers so about this. So you do and know. you remembered it, too. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what's that's even surprising. That's the part that's surprising me exactly. That's more impressive. Because I can't remember that. Um, is there a chip in there that I don't see? <laughs> yeah, right. I, I think maybe there might be. So you also talked about pulsatility. If you talk to any of the surgeons who are heavily involved in the Total Artificial Heart Project, mm -hmm. they are all continuous flow pumps mm -hmm. because that is the most, the least likely to fall apart mm. um, over time. More mm. reliable, more durability, greater durability. What, oh, I'm getting told we're running out of time. We're, just a few more minutes. We're gonna run a little over, I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, so how do you address that since y you said that pulsatility really mattered with renal blood flow? Well, that's been around for 40, 50 years and there's probably more papers that say the kidneys are more sensitive to pulsatility than not, but why do we get away with non-pulsatility, even on ECMO or on long-term cardiac assist devices? The reason we get away, away with it is because on the capillary level, there's no pulsatility. It's continuous. That's probably the reason we get away with it. Mm -hmm. But the body has been conditioned for pulsatility since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. The first thing that happens inside the womb on week three is there's a pulsatility flow that begins to happen. So there was no anticipation that we were going to go on perfusion with a non-pulsatile flow in the evolution. So it does want and need a pulsatility, but fortunately, because at the capillary level, it's a, it's a consistent flow without pulse. That's my theory as to why we get away with it. So what do you think about pumps that, that, that purport to provide a pulse? Anybody want to jump in on that idea? 
Well, yeah, if you ever have micro Do you really think they're of value, the well, little teeny pulse wave you get yeah. from uh, the pump? I mean, Matt, Min, Well, I, I, think, I, I think if you have a filter, you know, if you have a filter, uh, an arterial filter on in between where your pump is and, you know, where you're pumping to, if you're talking about a heart-lung machine. Uh-huh. If you're talking about a heart-lung machine, uh, just the flow, the, the you know the flow vector that goes down the tubing, uh, it gets dampened through the filter, and then it gets dampened through the cannula. And you know what you're really seeing at, at the actual aorta level, even with the pulsatile pumps, uh, you know for the old heart lung machines, you weren't getting much pulsatility past that cannula tip. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know the oxygenator takes some out of it as well. If you're but if you're talking just as a long term, uh, you know device. Um, to John's point, I don't think I don't think you're getting I don't think you're getting the pulsatility that the native heart is used to uh, you know used to providing to the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I frankly I think that it causes more harm than good. I think you're going to damage more red blood cells. I think you're causing jetting through the cannula. You know, shear forces, shear shear stress on the the blood components. I think the higher risk is involved with it with trying to generate a pulse in devices that are made out of polyvinyl chloride, polycarbonate connectors, a polycarbonate pump head, um, and a cannula tip that, you know, they call it a soft flow, but, you know, stab it in your eye and see how soft it is, you know? <laughs> so I'm not so sure I agree with that whole thing. But we're gonna end this up. I'm, 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 uh, they're, they're pouring vodka for me because I've been going, going too long. So, to it, but I have to just read this text to you, okay? That's all I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, Matt, and I need you to address this. I was sent a text, I won't say from who, but are you telling physicians, meaning me, not you, that Abiomed is responsible for ECMO reimbursement reduction? Hearing uh, this, I, I, I'm not. I'm not no, saying. No. I, I haven't read the papers. No, you, I, I, you, I, I, I'm just. Let me. Let me finish. This is just a text that came yeah. to me. That from you. This has nothing to do yep. with today's program. This yeah. was sent to me months ago. When this all happened, so don't feel. Don't worry. It's not you. But okay. it says. It says that they had absolutely nothing to do with it. So I, I'm confused because. I was, I, you know, and you said it too, and, and I'm not trying to hold, I'm not trying to put your feet to the fire. I'm not trying to make this, yep. you know, difficult for you. But the reality is I was told that by several sources. I, I, you've heard it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard it. Mm -hmm. Many people have heard this. This is not something that I just concocted in my head. Um, and it did happen. And I don't, I understand the reason and the motivation for it but I don't think that they should do something and then say, oh, we didn't say anything if they in fact did. Yeah, I, and that's why I, I, do, I didn't put that in the slide, to, I, uh, but the, the, I, that's why I put the letter uh, that came from ELSO and it, it, it describes in as the PVAD in parentheses Impella. Right. That, that, that is, you know, that's the device. Uh, and it's, it's, it's funny how they said, uh, industry consultants um, uh, were, were uh, industry industry were were the people that consulted with CMS. So right. I I have heard the same thing, Joe. Um, I don't have any you know concrete evidence that happened, but there there is the undertone of that. That's what that's what happened. Yes, we have no proof of that, and I would agree with that 100. percent But you know you know what they say about medicine. You know you know how they the saying where there's smoke there's fire except when it comes to medicine. Where there's smoke, there's usually a raging inferno. That's kind of how I feel about this. I mean, something happened, and it just seems odd to me that, you know, if you put their device in two, all of a sudden the reimbursement goes back up to what it was. One last quick question. If, I, if we put a, a, an L, if you put a left atrial vent in, transfemoral, transeptal, does that also bump your reimbursement up? Uh, for what I understand, it has to be done through a thoracotomy to, for its central uh, okay. to be considered. And I'm not sure, I don't think we've got the information back yet, whether that is actually being, um, because it, 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 most of the time it has to be put in, in an OR suite, uh, the, 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 the thoracotomy uh, venting. And so I'm, 
I, I believe they're considering that as central cannulation, mm. um, or you're actually, you're peripherally cannulated on ECMO, but you have a central vent. And so that's considered, uh, in what I understand it to be, uh, the reimbursement is it's centrally cannulation. Mm. Well, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I think the Impella is a good device, but I think like a lot of other devices, including the Taver valve, um, you can pick any device you want. I think that it too is going to become overutilized, um, overmarketed, and uh, I think in selected patients where it's appropriate, it's a very beneficial device, but it will end up being uh, used on patients where that might not have been the best option for them. I think we see that with a lot of things. And uh, with that, um, any other final comments from Min or Brianna? I did have one more question. Um, is, is there any um, specific, or I mean, this could be for you who also met, is there any specific concern for uh, like having a low hemoglobin or hematocrit for a patient um, on ECMO or on bypass that would affect directly be directed that, that would affect the, the kidneys like that is there a concerning value that in any papers that they say that you don't want to have a hemoglobin as low as eight or seven on bypass or on ECMO that could affect the kidneys in any way there's been so many papers written on uh, uh, low blood pressure low hemoglobin I actually put that in parentheses on the slide mm -hmm. and um, if you just look at below hemoglobin, at some point it's going to be bad because you're decreasing your liver of oxygen. Right, because that's part of the, the DO2. So there's been studies that said, well, let's look at liver of oxygen, and when you decrease your hemoglobin, if you make up for it in blood flow, the effect is okay. Um, surely, I mean, I think probably, you know, you don't want to be getting too low. You don't want to get probably too much below seven, or you want to stay above that. But if you, if you again, we're knowing minute to minute, second to second, what your liver of oxygen was. And like I said, if you diluted your patient by, you know, dropping in a liter of something, and you were working on getting that off, you would see a drop in your delivery of oxygen right away, and mm -hmm. you could bring that back up by increasing flow or, or reconcentrating it back. So I don't know what the magic number is. You could read a hundred articles, and it all say something mm -hmm. a little different. You know, some advocate a very high hemoglobin, and uh, there is beneficials to hemo a benefit to hemolution, you know. But um, you could see articles anywhere from seven to nine, most of them. Now, red blood cells are our primary buffer. Right. Red blood cells are our uh, uh, greatest uh, 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 has the greatest effect on COP. So you get your hemoglobin low enough, and uh, the next thing you know, you have all of the fluid uh, not going through the kidney and out the ureters, it's going out in the tissue and you're mm -hmm. becoming edematous, including the kidneys, which mm -hmm. we didn't even yeah. talk about. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna get in myself in a whole lot of trouble if we don't end this. I know we've gone over, it was our first program. Matt, you have any final words before you go? No, I appreciate, uh, thanks for having me and uh, the, the program was outstanding. This was, this was a great program. Thank you too, you were great. John, thanks, any final thoughts? No, but I hope that uh, us as perfusionists can just really start to focus on, you know, what we're delivering to the patient in terms of actual perfusion. Well, we need you to come yeah. back. Okay, so we're going to have to move you here to Houston. <laughs> okay, because this was an incredible bet. You too, you're going to have to come here too. They have big hospitals just like Vanderbilt that need you. Okay, TMC, you know what? What St. Luke's right now, St. Luke's T, uh, 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 Texas Art okay. Institute could definitely use you at this mm -hmm. point in time. So, uh, so why don't you come on out to Houston? You can ride <laughs> here right. on you can ride here on John's uh, on John's uh, uh, boat. <laughs> you take the trench. You know, there's like a little trench right there, and it brings right to Galveston Bay. We'll drive you up the rest of the way. Apparently not. <laughs> You're just laughing, but saying nothing. No, I'm good You're here. Literally I hanging on the cliff, Matt. <laughs> the trench? I, that, that wasn't. That didn't sell me. Oh, they call <laughs> it the ditch. <laughs> the ditch. The ditch, the ditch. It's an intercoastal waterway. Okay, I could have said the intercoastal waterway. It made it sound nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't want to go out in the big ocean with John's boat, I don't think. Mm -hmm. It's a houseboat. It's, I think it's got a flat bottom. It'd be rough. <laughs> You're still leaving me hanging, Matt. I'm going to let you close this out. 
what, 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 I, I, I don't think uh, I don't think I'm coming to Houston permanently. I can come down to visit. Okay, not very permanently. good. Well, once you get here, there's no getting out. It's the Hotel California okay. right here. Hotel California. All right, everybody. Listen, with that said, we're looking forward to our program tomorrow morning. We start bright and early, I think at uh, 930 or something like that. And 945. And we're going to continue this discussion about ECMO. Matt, John, thank you all very much. John, we'll see you tomorrow. Of course, you'll be here. Min's going to be here. Brianna has to have her hair done, so she's not going <laughs> yeah. to be here. And uh, with that said, good night. And thank you all very much once again for participating. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.